good? All right. Yep. The committee will come to order. Good morning and welcome to our witnesses and audience members. I want to thank you all for being here. Last month, most hardworking, honest Americans timely filed and paid their taxes. Today, we will examine the costs associated with those who did not, including the lost revenue and lost confidence in our tax system. Our hearing today will focus on understanding the tax gap. This is not a new issue. One of our colleagues here, Brian Dorgan, uh, brought this issue up many, many years ago as a member of this committee before he was elected to the Senate. This will provide a rough estimate of the level of overall noncompliance with our federal tax laws. The most recent Internal Revenue Service estimate of the annual gross tax gap is about $460 billion, and after enforcement activities and late payments, the net amount is $400 billion a year. Despite this astounding number, the true tax gap is greater than what the IRS estimates. This is because the IRS estimate does not include taxes owed on income from illegal activities or taxes avoided on certain international activities. The tax gap simply represents the estimate of different types of noncompliance with our individual corporate and other tax laws. First, there is noncompliance in the form of underreporting, which includes taxpayers who understate their income or overstate their deductions, exemptions, or credits. Taxes related to this underreporting account for nearly $390 billion dollars of the gross tax gap. Second, there is noncompliance by taxpayers who file their tax returns but fail to meet the deadline to pay what they owe. These underpayments account for about $40 billion of the gross tax gap. Third, there is noncompliance by taxpayers who are required to file a tax return and simply do not. Taxes on income of these non-filers account for about $32 billion of gross tax gap. Law-abiding taxpayers must certainly be disturbed that over $400 billion is not collected from those who are required to pay. The amount of the tax gap that the IRS can collect depends on its funding and resources. Insufficient IRS funding creates incentives for some taxpayers to take aggressive tax positions. Well-advised taxpayers, including multinational companies and high-income taxpayers, have the incentives and resources to do precisely that. Testimony today notes that high-income taxpayers have the most opportunity to engage in tax avoidance and its planning that accompanies it. However, the IRS is not focusing on these taxpayers. Instead, in 2017, I, the IRS targeted low-income, earned income tax credit taxpayers. Many question why the IRS is using its limited resources in this manner rather than deploying them on high-income tax earners and corporations where the return is greater per hour of a revenue agent's time. Taxpayers are more compliant when they may be audited, but the overall audit rate has plummeted below one-half of 1 percent. IRS examination of personnel have decreased by nearly 5,000 employees, or 38 percent, over seven years. Let me repeat that. 5,000 employees, or 38 percent, over seven years, and the IRS revenue offers have decreased by over 1,600 employees, or 42 percent, during the same period. With fewer, with fewer officers, Treasury fails to collect billions of dollars each year. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about their recommendations for closing the tax gap. And with that, I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Brady, for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Neal. The tax gap is an important issue, and Republicans on this committee support closing it. The tax gap, or the difference between tax amounts that taxpayers should pay versus what they actually pay, has been a persistent problem for <laughs> decades. The IRS periodically estimates the tax gap using audit and other data it collects. And as of April of 2016, the agency estimates, estimates the gap was approximately $458 billion in unpaid taxes per year between 2008 and 2010. This is clearly a problem. Some say the solution is more agents, more audits, and more intrusion into the private lives of taxpayers. We, we disagree. Republicans support closing the tax cap with better customer service, smarter audits, improved IRS assessment of the gap, and capitalizing on our simpler, improved tax code. For starters, we need to make sure that taxpayers are provided the customer service they deserve. Most Americans want to pay the taxes they owe, but do have a hard time when questions arise and they can't get through uh, to get help. We need to make it easier, which is why we required the IRS to create a customer service strategy in the Bipartisan Taxpayers First Act. 
which passed the House twice last year uh, and again this year. Thank you, Chairman. Additionally, the IRS needs to better utilize the vast amount of information it collects to estimate the tax gap. In doing so, it's paramount that taxpayer rights and taxpayer privacy are protected. The way the IRS currently estimates the tax gap comes at a huge personal cost to taxpayers, requiring significant time, in-person meetings, and tons of prep work. If the IRS is going to put taxpayers through that experience, let's outline a strategy on how it plans to use that information in a timely manner to close the tax gap. Additionally, we know that in order to address this gap, we have to address our changing economy. This is, somewhere, this is an area I believe we can work together on. Gig economy workers, such as folks who drive for Uber, use their homes for Airbnb, contribute greatly to our economy. We support innovation in our workforce and want to ensure these companies and these individuals can succeed. But as the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration has pointed out, who we'll hear from today, recently discovered there's a greater risk of folks who participate in the gig economy of noncompliance. TIGTA recommended to the IRS the agency develop a strategic plan to address tax administration in the gig economy and the IRS agreed on its importance. We believe the Congress must be involved in these discussions as well. Helping workers comply with the tax code is needed to reduce the gap. I know many on the other side of the dais today will cry foul, claim that Republicans have gutted the IRS over the years. Truth is, the IRS budget has been stable over the last several years, and any cuts by Congress were made only when compared to an all-time budget high. The truth of the matter is, IRS had lost its credibility and its trust during the Obama administration. Republicans are committed to ensuring that our nation's tax administrator does its job it's built to do, administer our tax code, and we are open to making sure that they have the resources you need to do that. Because especially as it concerns cl closing the tax gap, the solution must be myriad. There's no single approach that will fully and cost-effectively address the tax gap. The IRS cannot audit its way out of the tax gap. Solving it requires multiple solutions across different types of taxes. And as TICTA has found, the IRS can be using its current resources more effectively. There are opportunities that exist to help the IRS complete smarter audits. GAO has recommended ways in which the IRS could allocate enforcement resources to maximize its audit results. Before we discuss funding, let's take a look at the IRS's current standing. The agency does need to continue to show us it's capable of effectively managing its existing funds. The points we address today are simply a start. We ought to work together to close this gap while protecting taxpayers, further simplifying our tax code, and improving customer service while working with the IRS to achieve that. Thank you, Chairman Neal, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Brady. And without objection, all members' opening statements will be made part of the official record. We have a distinguished panel of witnesses here with us this morning to discuss the tax gap and taxpayer noncompliance with federal regulations. First, I want to welcome the Honorable J. Russell George, the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration at the United States Department of the Treasury. Next, Mr. James McTighe, the Director of Tax Issues and Strategic Issues for the United States Government Accountability Office, the GAO. Then, Mr. Ben Hurden, the Chief Research and Analytics Officer at the Internal Revenue Service. And finally, Mr. Kenneth Wood, former IRS Deputy Associate Chief Counsel at the IRS, official of Chief Counsel on the international side. Each of your statements will be made part of the record in its entirety. I would ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes or less to help with that, there is a timing light on your table. When you have one minute left, the light will switch from green to yellow, and then finally to red when five minutes are up. Mr. George, would you please begin? Thank you, Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the tax gap, as well as opportunities for the IRS to improve taxpayer compliance. As you noted, the tax gap, or the difference between what taxpayers owe and what they pay timely, is estimated to be $458 billion annually. After enforcement efforts, the estimated net tax gap is $408 billion annually, a non-compliance rate of about 16 percent. Increased compliance lessens the tax gap. IRS studies have shown that audits have the greatest impact on tax compliance. 
Due to diminished resources, the number of IRS examination personnel has decreased 38% from fiscal year 2010 to fiscal year 2017. Accordingly, the number of audits has also decreased by 32% from 1.6 million in fiscal year 2013 to 1.1 million in fiscal year 2017. The IRS's FY20 budget requests additional funding for compliance positions, which would enhance compliance efforts. TICTA has identified compliance program improvements that would require little, if any, additional resources. For example, a significant shift is taking place in our economy and the evolution of what is referred to as the gig economy, as was noted. Technological innovations are positive and important to our economy. However, the IRS lacks a strategy to address this change. Billions of dollars in potential tax discrepancies involving taxpayers' earnings in the gig economy are not reported and addressed. Due to this missed opportunity, many cases with discrepancies are being overlooked with thousands of gig economy-related cases not scrutinized. Furthermore, gig economy companies play by a different set of rules when it comes to reporting to the IRS what our workers are paid. Certain gig economy businesses are not required to issue tax documents unless workers earn at least $20,000, among other requirements. The expansion of the gig economy has led to an information gap, which Congress should consider closing. When income information is not reported to the IRS, taxpayers tend to be much less tax compliant. Another example involves tip income, which constitutes approximately 10% of the underreporting component of the tax gap. The IRS is not adequately examining noncompliance in this area. The realm of virtual currencies continues to present a significant risk to tax administration due to the anonymity of transactions and the lack of third-party information reporting to the IRS. The IRS needs to develop a compliance strategy with respect to virtual currencies. It must provide additional guidance to assist taxpayers with their tax compliance and revise third-party information reporting documents to identify virtual currency-related transactions. Recent reviews we conducted found that the IRS lacks processes to address significant employer and payer noncompliance with reporting and remitting taxes withheld. We are also preparing a report detailing the IRS's efforts to ensure compliance with non-payroll withholding tax reporting and payment provisions. This review identified billions of dollars in non-payroll tax withholding discrepancies which are not being addressed. In conclusion, the IRS can more effectively shrink the tax gap by developing compliance strategies for our changing economy and use its revenue agent resources and information reporting more effectively to conduct tax audits. Congress can assist by ensuring the IRS has the resources necessary to do its job and by reducing the information gap wherever possible. Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to share my views. This concludes my statement. Thank you, Mr. George. With that, let me recognize Mr. McTighe to begin. Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady, and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to discuss the tax gap, which has been a persistent problem for decades. In fact, enforcement of tax laws has been on GAO's list of programs that are at high risk due to their vulnerability to fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement, or in need of transformation since we first compiled the list back in 1990. Unfortunately, as others have noted, there are no easy fixes to this problem, and given persistent levels of noncompliance, reducing the tax gap will not likely be achieved through a single solution. Rather, the tax gap must be attacked on multiple fronts with multiple strategies over a sustained period of time. Completely eliminating the tax gap is also not feasible. It would entail more intrusive enforcement and more burdensome record keeping and reporting than the public would be willing to accept, and more resources than the IRS is able to commit. 
However, even a modest reduction in the tax gap would yield significant financial benefits. For example, a 1% reduction in the tax gap would result in about $4 billion more a year in revenue, clearly not an insignificant amount. In fact, that's nearly the entire IRS budget for enforcement. That amount would also fund the entire operations of the Census Bureau or the combined operations of the National Park System, the Smithsonian Institution, and the National Archives. Addressing the tax gap is also important because tax noncompliance, even when unintentional, can discourage compliant taxpayers and undermine the integrity of the tax system and the public's confidence in it. Those who do not pay their taxes are shifting the fiscal burden to those who do pay. Noncompliance can also create an unfair competitive advantage among businesses. Again, those who do not pay their taxes are avoiding costs that tax compliant businesses incur. GAO's work has highlighted three important factors that contribute to the tax gap. First, the extent to which individual taxpayers accurately report their income is greatest when their income is reported to them and to the IRS by a third party. For example, when employers withhold taxes from and, and report information on wages, taxpayers misreported only 1% of such income. In contrast, taxpayers misreported over half of their business income for which there is little or no third-party information reporting. Second, the final year covered by the tax gap estimate, 2010, was the high watermark of the IRS budget. Since then, IRS's budget has fallen to the point where it is 5% below the fiscal year 2000 level when adjusted for inflation. This, despite increasing responsibilities such as implementing the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and the Affordable, the Affordable Care Act and growing threats from cyber criminals and identity theft refund fraudsters. IRS has almost 40% fewer enforcement personnel now than it did in 2010, and audit rates have fallen dramatically, potentially inf affecting enforcement revenue and more concerning voluntary compliance. Third, the federal tax system contains complex rules that may be necessary to achieve some tax policy goals, such as providing benefits to specific tax specific groups of taxpayers. However, this complexity also imposes a wide range of record keeping, planning, and filing requirements upon taxpayers. This complexity can lead to errors and underpaid taxes. Complexity and the lack of transparency that it can create can also create doubts about the tax system's integrity. GAO has made numerous recommendations to IRS to address these challenges, many of which have not yet been implemented. For example, IRS needs to develop a robust strategy outlining actions that it will take to maximize the data it collects to update compliance programs and approaches, as well as a strategy to improve taxpayer service to better assist compliant taxpayers trying to meet their tax filing responsibilities. GAO has also identified several actions Congress can take to help address the tax gap. Key among these are requiring additional electronic filing of tax and information returns, which could help IRS improve compliance in a resource efficient way. Providing IRS with broader authority with appropriate safeguards to correct errors on tax returns could improve compliance while reducing the burden on taxpayers. And finally, giving the IRS the authority to regulate paid tax return preparers could improve the accuracy of the tax returns they prepare. Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady, and members of the committee, this concludes my prepared remarks. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. McTighe. With that, Dr. Hurden, would you please begin? Chairman Neal, <clears throat> Ranking Member Brady, and members of the committee, my name is Dr. Benjamin Herndon. I am the IRS's Chief Research and Analytics Officer. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today and discuss my office's work related to the methodology underlying the tax gap analysis and estimates. Before joining the IRS in 2016, I spent seven years as a research professor in the business school at the Georgia Institute of Technology. My field of specialization is in cognitive and technical strategies. <clears throat> I hold three advanced degrees from the University of Texas at Austin, including a PhD in organization science. In my role at the IRS, I direct the agency's Office of Research, Applied Analytics and Statistics which is also called RAS, 
We support effective and efficient tax administration by providing strategic research, analytics, statistics, and insight to the IRS's business units to inform their decision making and increase innovation across the agency. One of the functions of RAS is to oversee the data collection and methodology the IRS uses to measure the tax gap. The tax gap is defined as the difference between the amount of tax owed by taxpayers for a given year and the amount that is actually paid voluntarily and timely. The tax gap represents in dollar terms the annual amount of noncompliance with our tax laws. The most recent IRS study of the tax gap was released in 2016 covering tax years 2008 through 2010. The study estimates the average annual gross tax gap for that period at $458 billion and the voluntary tax compliance rate at 81.7%. The previous study covering tax year 2016 estimated the gross tax gap at $450 billion and the voluntary compliance rate at 83.1%. The IRS is in the process of preparing a new study on the tax gap covering tax years 2011 through 2013, and we expect this report to be released later this year. The figure of $458 billion that I referenced earlier does not account for the revenue brought in through enforcement activities, such as audits and document matching. After factoring in those activities, the average net tax gap for 2008 through 2010 is estimated to be $406 billion per year. When looked at by mode of compliance, the tax gap can be divided into three primary components, non-filing or not filing returns on time, under-reporting or not reporting one's full tax liability when the return is filed, or underpayment, not paying by the due date the full amount of tax or reported on a timely filed return. By far the largest component of the tax gap is underreporting, representing 387 billion of the 458 billion total. Individual underreporting comprises 264 billion of that 387 billion dollar number, while employment tax represents 81 billion dollars, corporate income tax, corporate tax for $41 billion and excise tax $1 billion. The latest results confirm an important point about the tax gap. The compliance rate is very high for income that is subject to third-party information reporting and higher still when you also have withholding. The 2016 study found that when there is information reporting, such as 1099s, income is underreported only about 7% of the time. That number drops to 1% for income subject to both third-party reporting and withholding. But the number jumps to 63% for income not subject to any third-party reporting or withholding. Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady, and members of the committee, that concludes my statement, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Hurden. And with that, let me recognize Mr. Wood. Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady, and members of the Ways and Means Committee, thank you for inviting me to discuss issues regarding enforcement and compliance in the international tax system. The views expressed herein are my own and should not be attributed to any other source. Very briefly, I practiced international tax for 34 years, both in the government and in private practice, with many years focused on transfer pricing. From 2016 to 2018, I was the Deputy Associate Chief Counsel International in the Office of Chief Counsel IRS, where I was responsible for transfer pricing and international programs. I retired in August of 2018. The business world is very complex, involving legal, transactional, financial, and contractual complexity. To ensure that businesses properly report their income, the Internal Revenue Code, regulations, and other guidance are in turn voluminous and very complex. Over the last 30 plus years, transfer pricing has posed the greatest threat to the tax base. The relevant tax authority is section 42 and the regulations they're under, which basically set out the arm's length standard. However, these rules cannot provide much more than a framework for evaluating prices charged for sales of goods, transfers of intangible property, provision of services, loans and advances, et cetera between related parties. The facts of each transaction are typically very complex. The economic analysis is difficult and not susceptible of precision, and the legal guidelines are somewhat blunt. 
As a result, the task of auditing the pricing of trillions of dollars of transactions within the statute of limitations is an extraordinarily heavy lift. And as budgets shrink and senior personnel with substantial transfer pricing experience retire and cannot be replaced, transfer pricing audits become much more challenging and tax revenues fall. On the other side are large, well-advised multinational corporations that control the facts but resist responding to legitimate IRS inquiries in a timely manner in the hope that they can run out the clock. Given the tax dollars at risk, these taxpayers spend tens of millions of dollars annually on tax controversy. If you are curious, I suggest you review the financial statements of taxpayers that have recently litigated or are litigating a large transfer pricing case. These expenditures support not just a substantive defense of their tax position, but also efforts to undermine the IRS's ability to develop its case. It is hardball litigation by counsel zealously representing their clients, and they have far larger budgets than the IRS. Taxpayers are understandably willing to spend millions to save billions. While the IRS has excellent, very hardworking litigators, the organization has far fewer resources than taxpayers to devote to these cases. I'd like to share an example based on a recent tax court opinion that will give you an idea of what the IRS is up against. A major U.S. multinational with a huge market share manufactures and sells high-tech medical devices. It performs all the research and development using senior scientists and engineers and owns all of the intangible property, patents, trademarks, etc. It manufactures all the components to exacting specifications, obtains all the regulatory approvals, and writes all the embedded software. It then ships the components to a subsidiary in a low-tax jurisdiction, and the subsidiary performs a straightforward assembly and testing operation pursuant to instructions provided by the U.S. parent. The subsidiary then ships the assembled product back to the U.S. parent, where a sophisticated, experienced sales team takes the product to doctors and other health professionals for sale. The product is then implanted in human bodies. The taxpayer in this case claimed on its income tax return that more than 60% of the total net income from all activities was attributable to the assembly and testing operations of the subsidiary. It doesn't take a transfer pricing expert to know that most of the value of this product was derived from functions performed and assets employed by the U.S. parent. Interestingly, more than 90% of the costs of the entire operation were incurred by the U.S. parent. That the taxpayer took an aggressive position was not surprising. What was surprising was that the tax court concluded that the taxpayer was largely correct. Although the Court of Appeals reversed and remanded this opinion, it illustrates the challenges the IRS faces to achieve rational results. There are no easy answers to resolve these challenges, but substantially increasing the IRS budget is necessary if the IRS is to prevail in large, complex cases. Revisions to the tax court rules and practices would also help create a more level playing field. Average American taxpayers deserve at least that much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wood. We will now proceed to questioning under the five-minute rule. Consistent with committee practice, I will recognize those members present at the time the gavel came down in order of seniority, and I will begin by recognizing myself. Inspector General George, how has technology allowed the IRS to enforce the tax laws and collect from those who don't pay? The IRS makes extensive use of technology, Mr. Chairman, um, and it is something that is completely required given the massive tax burden that uh, the American people have and the obligation of the IRS to con consider their returns and process them and issue refunds when appropriate on an expedited basis. An example of the technology that they use includes uh, the return review program, which allows them to uh, review returns for mistakes and to ensure information that they've received independent of the taxpayer comports with the information that the taxpayer has provided. A similar uh, device or, or, or program is the automated uh, under-reporter program that attempts to achieve the same goal, ensuring that the information that the IRS receives is uh, accurate, uh, both in terms of the taxpayer as well as 
the supplier of third-party information. That said, much more could be done. Again, as I stated in my opening statement, as well as in my written testimony, with these advancing eco economy uh, tools, meaning or, you know, the gig economy, when, when I'm and by gig economy, for those who are not very familiar, I mean, for example, Uber uh, em employees or contractors or Lyft and, uh, and many others who are just not necessarily reporting all of the income that they received and the IRS not having information to the contrary. So this is a, a, a tremendous opportunity for people to not comply with their tax obligation. And so if the IRS simply altered some of their programming to take into account uh, this gap and or issued regulations, and this is where, again, I made reference to non-resource, meaning dollar amount, necessarily to ensure that a new process could be put in place to require both information to those gig economy participants, namely both the companies as well as the individuals who work for those companies, more can be done. Thank you. I heard it described last weekend as the contingent economy, and I thought that that was an apt description. Uh, let me follow up with you, uh, Inspector General. Why, it's, why is it important to audit high wealth taxpayers, and what has happened to the IRS program for examining these taxpayers? Well, as, and I hate to resort to this type of statement, but as Willie Sutton said, that's where the money is. And as it relates to. He came to, from Massachusetts, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> so, the high income taxpayers tend to have an addition, obviously additional money, more money owed, but very complicated tax returns. So I know there's a concern that um, some lower income individuals receive audits in the form of correspondence, which is a more simplistic way for the IRS to address issues of or just questions of noncompliance, sa that same method is not effective as it relates to people who have very complicated tax returns, namely wealthy individuals. So uh, the IRS has to be able to provide resources other than a letter to a taxpayer as it relates to higher income uh, returns. Thank you. You answered my next question. But Dr. Hurden, the IRS is preparing a new tax gap estimate to be released next month. What has changed since the last report? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, unfortunately, it would be premature for us to comment on what the new tax gap report tells us in contrast to the previous reports. Uh, we are still tabulating the data at the highest level and obviously are concerned about releasing any, any indication of where we think that might be headed when we haven't had an opportunity to fully vet it internally. Mm -hmm. Um, so I appreciate the question. It's okay. certainly something that's on all of our minds, and we will release that report as soon as we can. And you believe that's next month? Uh, I'm, I believe it will be June or July is my understanding. And I hope you can get that to us almost at the time of publication. Certainly. Thank you. And Director McTighe, what needs to be done to get the tax gap off the GAO's high-risk list? Chairman Neal, uh, as you are aware, GAO uses five criteria to assess the progress in addressing high-risk areas. The five criteria are leadership commitment, and I should say that we have assessed IRS as fully meeting that criteria. Agency capacity is the second, an action plan is the third criteria, monitoring efforts is the fourth, and demonstrated progress uh, toward meeting uh, the actions that they outline. Uh, over the years, JO has talked about three pillars of the tax gap. The first we've talked a little bit about already, and that is enforcement. To the extent that IRS can go after non-compliant taxpayers, whether through audits, notices, or through improved education, uh, that can help the tax gap. The second pillar that we've talked about is taxpayer service, helping those who are trying to comply with their tax reporting 
uh, filing requirements and obligations to actually be able to do that is uh, key to any success. And we have long recommended that IRS develop a customer service strategy, a comprehensive ser service strategy that involves meeting the taxpayer in ways that they want to interact with the IRS, whether that's in person, online, on the telephone, or through correspondence. To this date, IRS has not released a comprehensive customer service strategy. In 2015, or 2016, we actually had a matter before Congress to require the Treasury, in conjunction with working with the IRS commissioner, to develop such a strategy. Uh, the Congress passed a resolution requiring such a customer service strategy, and as I said, to this date, IRS has not produced that strategy. And finally, the third pillar that we've talked about is uh, tax complexity. The easier it is for taxpayers to understand and report, they can be compliant. So to the extent that uh, filing can be simplified, the tax law be simplified, we think that uh, enhances voluntary compliance as well. Thank you. Let me recognize the ranking member, Mr. Brady. Thank you, Chairman Neal, um, and thank you for calling this hearing. Um, the IRS uh, may not be popular, but it has an awfully lot of good folks there. We know because they solve a lot of constituent problems for us. I remember a day when I couldn't tell you what party the IRS commissioner was because uh, they were objective. They were in our offices twice a year. We were working together, regardless of party, on tax gap, on, in, on information technology, on customer service, all those key areas of making sure our nation's tax collector and administrator, administrator is doing their job, and we're helping them do that. There's no, I made no bones about it. I, I was very disappointed in a series of the acting uh, commissioners in the previous administration. Uh, I think uh, John Koskinen did terrible damage to the credibility of this agency. I think, though, always underneath, there's been a core of professionals all the way down to the, the field agents and others, though, wanting desperately to do an excellent job. And so I'm, I have high hopes for Commissioner Reddick, and I hope we return to the day where with hearings like this, Chairman, and thank you for calling them, we can simply work together uh, to make the IRS work better and smarter. So I want to talk about that for a moment. Uh, Mr. McTighe, a 2012 report by your agency found there was a lot of potential for the IRS to reduce the tax cap by making more better use of its resources, uh, in, in effect, in the enforcement program. For example, by decreasing field audits, increasing correspondent audits, uh, shifting some audit resources from the lower wealth individuals to the higher wealth individuals. And then a follow-up report from JO recommended that IRS set goals for tax compliance and have that comprehensive strategy. So is the IRS following those recommendations? Uh, which of those have they fully embraced? Are there areas where they can make better use of its resources to close this gap? Representative Brady, uh, you're correct. Our 2012 report did look at the various um, enforcement programs, different types of audits across different ta types of taxpayers. And what we did find was that by reallocating about $100 million uh, from audits with low yield or success rates to audits where uh, noncompliance was greater, uh, the IRS potentially could recoup close to a billion dollars. So we thought that was a very high return on investment. IRS did agree with our recommendations and have been taking steps to implement uh, that recommendation. They've been working diligently trying to estimate marginal cost and uh, have made strides uh, calculating marginal revenue. So you need those two components, both the cost and the revenue uh, before you can come up with a uh, good measure of marginal return on investment. And it's uh, the analysis that we did looked at average return on investment, but you know, to really refine the methodology, you have to take it to the next step. Yeah. IRS so, has made progress. They need to do a little bit more research uh, to finish that, uh, that analysis. And th that brings me to the point of, uh, and uh, Dr. Herndon can speak more eloquently about this, but the 
IRIS's use of data. Over the years, GEO has made a number of recommendations that IRIS needs to more fully leverage all the data that they collect. I mean, essentially, IRS is a giant information processing organization. They have a lot of data. They use a lot of it, but there's even more value in the data that they collect, and that can improve understanding of compliance and noncompliance. It can improve audit approaches, and it can also uh, less reduce the uh, burden on compliant taxpayers by better targeting or selecting returns uh, for audit. Great. Thank you, sir. And could you let the committee know by letter if there are any of those recommendations that weren't implemented yet by the IRS that we need to be aware of so we can continue to follow up? And Mr. George, recently you recommended IRS improve the way it uses its resources and makes decisions by better monitoring audit closures in different compliance areas. Did the IRS agree with those recommendations? Have they implemented them? They have agreed, and they're in the process of doing so, sir. Good. Thank you. Look, I think I just want to point out, while there may be a lot of discussion today about increasing the IRS funding, you know, I believe the agency, while working forward, still needs to do a better job with the funding resources it currently has, and we are uh, eager to continue to help them improve. That I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Georgia to inquire, Mr. Lewis. Good morning, and welcome, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. I would appreciate if each of you would expand upon your testimony on the importance of restoring funding, staff, and training in the IRS. Starting with you, uh, uh, Mr. Jo uh, Mr. Lewis, there's a, a fact toy that I'd like to share, and that is, we have calculated that the 1,600 fewer revenue officers that the IRS has now, and this is actually a figure that from 2010 to 2017, they have 1,600 fewer revenue officers. We validated that each revenue officer is able to bring in roughly $2 million each, which would result in over $3 billion of less revenue brought into the IRS as a result of the reduction in those revenue officers. That's striking. So th there is no question that if there were additional revenue officers, um, I know most Americans dread the notion of being audited, but as I pointed out, in my oral and written testimony, that is the most effective way the IRS has to collect revenue. Continue down the line, down the row. Congressman Lewis, I, I would comment that GEO issued a report this spring looking at strategic human capital management at IRS, and what we found was a little disturbing in that given the year after year of budget cuts since 2010, IRS has lost people in critical skills area, including the human capital function, where uh, you know highly skilled people come up with, you know, do the studies to analyze and find, you know, where are the skills missing in the operation, what skills will be needed in the future, and because no hiring was going on, no training was going on, that function atrophied. As uh, the Inspector General just mentioned the enforcement area suffered as well, and I would also add that the taxpayer service function uh, suffered as well. Over the years, IRS has struggled to maintain a adequate level of service on, on phones to answer taxpayer questions. On the enforcement side, audit rates are way down, and uh, you know while it's hard to quantify any kind of estimates, Enforcement revenue has been more or less constant over the last several years at about 50 billion. IRS's budget at about 11 or 12 billion. That alone is an, a very positive ROI of four to five dollars for every dollar invested in IRS. Thank you. No, there are a number of figures regarding uh, ROI from investment in the IRS. Uh, you know, while I can't pin one down in particular, I, I can say undeniably uh, 
that this is an organization that could do more with more resources. Uh, in my particular organization, uh, I see this in the area of uh, attracting and retaining data and analytics talent, uh, which you might uh, know is probably one of the more sought after skill sets in the uh, private economy at this time. Um, and as we look forward to a service that hopefully takes greater advantage of data in its activities and operations, that will be a critical capability uh, as we move forward. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Wood. Congressman Lewis, I can't give you um, specific numbers with respect to um, the IRS's personnel involved in large case litigation. Um, I can certainly tell you that um, when they match up against um, the private sector, um, typically in cases involving um, billions of dollars of proposed efficiencies, that um, the number of people um, employed by the taxpayer um, and used to um, both uh, build their own case and impede the government's case is far in excess of what the IRS can bring to the table. Um, the, if you look at the docket in the tax court, I think there are roughly 30,000 cases at any one time. That is the bulk of the tax litigation. Um, and that's what the IRS chief counsel's office is responsible for. Um, and, and including all that, then you have these massive cases um, with, which are hugely complicated um, and you need big resources to match up against the other side and they simply don't have them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Let me recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate this hearing opportunity today. It's certainly uh, an important topic. And I know that as we sort out the various details and complexities of the tax code, I, I hope that we can continue to uh, simplify the tax code. We did that uh, somewhat recently, but I, I think we need clear uh, guidelines, for example, on how contractors, freelancers, and others outside the traditional employer-employee relationship are treated by the tax code. Uh, this will improve compliance on both sides of, of these relationships. At the same time, we should uh, look back at mistakes which have been made in the past to inform ways in which we should not go about uh, trying to uh, supposedly improve compliance in some of these relationships. One recent example stands out to me, and that was the vast expansion of the 1099 reporting requirements which were included in the ACA. Under that expansion, businesses would have been required to provide a 1099 to every individual or business from whom they bought more than $600 in goods or services. Almost immediately, I heard from businesses across my district about the massive new paperwork burden this would have created for them. One restaurateur from my district I spoke with would have gone from a handful of, of 1099s each year to dozens upon dozens. Carrying that forward to today's conversation, I can only imagine the difficulties someone wanting to participate in the gig economy would face if they had to start issuing 1099s to gas stations, tire stores, service stations, and their phone provider under this regulation. Thankfully, we repealed that provision on a bipartisan basis. What we really need are easy to follow rules under a simpler tax code, which make it clear how to comply and when people are not complying. Mr. McTeague, your agency has long argued that one key component to reducing the tax gap is to improve the simplicity and administration of the tax code. Uh, essentially, that if you reduce the burden on taxpayers, they are, more, they are more likely to comply and pay what they owe. Would you agree with that characterization? Yes, sir. Thank you. And I believe that the GAO has long suggested that you can simplify the tax code and reduce the tax gap through fundamental tax reform. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. We have made some good progress uh, to that end in the Tax Cuts and, and Jobs Act. We nearly doubled the standard deduction, meaning a substantial number of taxpayers no longer needed to itemize their deductions. We also reduced individual and corporate tax rates, so there is less of an incentive for taxpayers to avoid paying punitive tax rates. All of these efforts to simplify the tax code also save taxpayers hard-earned money. According to the Tax Foundation, the changes we made to the tax, co tax code from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act resulted in compliance cost savings up to $5.4 billion. Mr. Mc Mr. McTeague and Mr. George, would you agree that these steps simplified the tax code for taxpayers and overall should help them comply with the tax code? 
Uh, again, I missed that last part, sir. Uh, would you agree that uh, the steps that uh, we took, such as doubling the standard deduction and other steps in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, simplified the tax code for taxpayers and overall should help them in, in compliance? Congressman, as Mr. McTeague noted and as you uh, asserted in the preface of your, your question, there is no question making it simpler to comply with your tax obligations would ensure greater, greater compliance on the part of the taxpayer. It, it's QED. Very well. Very well. Thank you. Mr. McTeague, anything you'd like to add? I would agree as well. In particular, the doubling of the standard deduction uh, is an excellent case of where uh, the tax code was simplified, made filing easier for many taxpayers. There are other provisions of the bill, the law, that introduce a new complexity, and I think the Congress and others are working to, on those areas as well. Uh, the one thing I, I would also add, yeah, I actually see the gig economy as an opportunity to uh, address the tax gap, because what we have with the gig economy are platforms or digital uh, information systems that are tracking payments, so that has the potential to reduce the burden on both the workers and the companies uh, employing those workers, okay. uh, and you know, very easily provide that information to both the workers and the IRS to potentially increase compliance. Thank you. I yield the balance of my time to Mr. Brady. So thank, I want to follow up with, with Mr. Smith. So Mr. George, you said 1,600 more IRS agents would yield $3 billion? That is so if we unleash 1,600 more agents on the country, we reduce the tax gap by less than 1 percent? Well, again, we use the number based on a formula, sir. So yeah. you have to assume, assuming everything else remains the same, yes. So yes, thank you. Thank you. Let me recognize the gentleman from Texas to inquire, Mr. Doggett. Thank you. Gentlemen, I, I very much appreciate your testimony. But I would say that the one instrument that would be the most helpful to this committee in understanding why this tax gap has not been addressed is a mirror. Uh, this gigantic tax gap did not happen by accident. Uh, it is the direct result of the failures and the indifference of this committee over the last years, and sometimes its deliberate attempt to facilitate tax dodging. We've gone through a period of time when the IRS has been held up as a failure, as a, uh, a harm to the American economy, uh, and uh, the committee and its allies throughout this House have done their best to assure that the IRS lack the resources to be a success. The uh, committee learned of the Panama Papers not through any of its work, but through excellent investigative journalism and despite pleas that it respond and conduct its own investigation, it did absolutely nothing. The committee learned and had requests for action following the Paradise Papers, other excellent investigative reporting about international tax dodging. It did absolutely nothing. And in addition to uh, uh, the failure to investigate and fulfill its responsibilities, it has been told over and over again not that anything you said this morning, Mr. George, is really a surprise that if we'd invest a dollar in enforcement, we'd get about $3 back uh, for the Treasury. Not having to raise taxes on other people, but simply seeing that those who owe taxes pay their fair share. But the committee largely ignored that testimony, and only this year in the Budget Committee, there were Republican efforts uh, to undermine attempts to increase uh, IRS enforcement to get the revenue that some people are dodging. Of course, the tax gap is not helped when the most powerful person in the country and in the world tells Americans it is smart, to use his word, to not pay taxes. Uh, indeed, only this week, President Trump declared after we learned that he was the biggest loser uh, in America for many years when it came to uh, what he showed on his tax returns, almost twice uh, some years than, other, than the next largest loser, when his response was in a tweet this week, and I quote, you always wanted to show losses for tax purposes. Almost all real estate developers did, and often to negotiate with banks, it was sport. It was sport, 
what words for the President of the United States when we want public confidence in our tax system to declare its sport to underreport to dodge your taxes. Of course, uh, this comes after a special reward that he and other real estate developers like this got through the good graces of this committee. Well, may, that may be a little bit of an overstatement. Actually, this committee didn't include a special provision for real estate promoters, nor did the Senate, nor did the House, until the conference committee. And after the conference committee, a special Trump tax provision was added, just as was the special provision to lower the tax rate for the most wealthy people in the country. I want to ask Mr. Uh, Chairman to include uh, in the record uh, the new report from ProPublica, the IRS tried to take on the ultra-wealthy and it didn't go well. Hearing no objection, such would be the order. Uh, Mr. George, in 2009, the IRS created a unit called the Global High Wealth Group to audit taxpayers worth over $10 million. Uh, the current IRS commissioner, uh, Mr. Reddig, Mr. Trump's appointee, was at that time with a well-heeled well law firm. He referred to the work of this group as audits from hell. Uh, is it true, sir, that at this point uh, the IRS has still not established the Global High Wealth Division as a standalone entity and that it has been, quote, de-emphasized organizationally? It is true, sir, that they have not yet established that. Thank you. Yeah. So after all this time, something could have been done, but we have an IRS commissioner in place who doesn't really believe in this. And Mr. Wood, you've described the machinations that uh, these international corporations go through to avoid paying their fair share of our national security. As you know, I have legislation that simply says you don't have an incentive to go abroad because you pay the same tax rate there as you do here. It's part of the attempt to prevent the outsourcing of American jobs and profits. If that were the law, would that reduce the incentive for these transfer pricing games? It would certainly reduce um, the incentive um, to do so, um, I would say yeah, that the, Thank you. The, um, I think it's uh, an open question as to whether the 2017 Act might also have reduced the incentive by currently taxing some offshore profits and also reducing the profits, uh, the, reducing the rate on the, the FDII income. And I um, certainly I will tell, but certainly yep. eliminating deferral and taxing it at the full rate would certainly go a long way toward doing I agree that. with you on that, save the three loopholes that were created by the same act. Thank you. Mr. Merchant, you wish to inquire? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, our offices get a, a lot of phone calls about I, the IRS, and uh, they're usually not calling to help to reduce the tax gap. They're usually calling uh, because they haven't gotten their refund or they feel like they've been tr uh, treated unfairly. So my questions will be about customer service. Uh, and I do appreciate, though, as a congressman, the IRS's program where they have a liaison that our offices can call uh, to help our constituents. It's been it's very helpful to me in my district office. Uh, Mr. McTeague, can you talk about the interaction between providing high quality customer service to taxpayers and how it affects voluntary compliance? Absolutely. As I mentioned in my oral statement, uh, to the extent that IRS can help taxpayers wanting to pay their taxes, understand the tax code, understand their filing requirements, and help them be compliant, uh, we all win. It's hard to quantify uh, just how much of an impact that has, uh, but we feel it's very important. It's important, you know, as technology is changing and expectations of customers are changing with new technologies and uh, comfort with interacting with businesses and government agencies online that IRS focus on developing state-of-the-art online services to meet those taxpayers where they're comfortable, but not forgetting uh, those who would like to walk into an office and talk to an agent or a you know, customer service representative. We, we have missed that. Our, our constituents have missed the ability to walk into an office, by the way. Do you think that the IRS uh, 
has the proper uh, information to set benchmarks and are they uh, approaching their customer service um, programs the same way that a, a business would approach their customer service uh, objectives? Do you think that they have those tools? Right. Um, you know, part of the impetus behind our recommendations over the years for us to develop a comprehensive customer service strategy was to, you know, find out what taxpayers, what IRS's customers need and want from the IRS, and then to, you know, set appropriate measures and benchmarks so that they could actually uh, be, you know, measure their performance in those areas and uh, be evaluated against those measures. Uh, IRS has taken some steps. We currently have work underway for this committee to look at the type of customer service measures that IRS employs, whether or not they're still appropriate and relevant to, as I mentioned, the changing technology and service channels. So you know, they've taken some steps. We think more needs to be done in that area. Are you, are you supportive of the provisions in the Taxpayer First Act for the IRS to develop that? I mean, you're, you continue to tell them that they need to develop it. In, I'm sorry, to develop the customer in, in service the strategy? the First Act, yes. Absolutely. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Congress actually required IRS two years ago to develop a comprehensive customer service strategy. It was in the 2017 uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act, and it was, IRS was given a six-month deadline to develop that plan and submit it to the appropriation committees. And to my knowledge, that has not happened two years later. Uh, just recently, in response to the uh, Tax Cuts and Job Act, Commissioner Reddick has uh, testified that the IRS has adapt, uh, adapted 500 forms and publications uh, to prepare for the 2019 filing season. Of course, we won't know the result of that process uh, for some time, but uh, have you, are you aware of those form changes and, and is it your opinion that they will have a positive effect? We, we have not looked at that issue directly, to my knowledge. Uh, we, we did look at the filing season and you know, with all the changes that IRS needed to implement uh, for, uh, for this past filing season and that coupled with the shutdown, IRS originally had a goal of about 80% level of service for answering telephones. Uh, after the shutdown, they had to reduce that goal to about 65%. Uh, but they did achieve, I think it was 67% level of service. So, uh, you know, given the increased volume of, of questions result, you know, from the new tax law, I, I think IRS, uh, you know, managed best they could. Thanks for your testimony. Thank you. I recognize myself uh, for five minutes. Uh, thank you all for being here to uh, testify before us. I want to go back to the. Uh, a couple of our colleagues, uh, issue a couple of our colleagues talked about, and that's the uh, underfunding of the IRS. It was noted that for every dollar that we invest in the IRS results in a $4 uh, in higher returns. Uh, the numbers that we heard, the $3 billion hole uh, was uh, uh, pretty in, in, impressive. Um, and uh, since 2010, IRS's funding has declined to the point where uh, enforcement staff levels have decreased by nearly 40 percent. And uh, Dr. Herndon, how has decreased funding for the IRS impacted its enforcement ability, and what impact has that had on our tax gap? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> obviously, decreased funding has reduced the ability to conduct a number of operations across the service. Um, you know, I, I have seen, obviously, a lot more evidence in my particular area of what the, the decrease in, in uh, funding had created about the time that I came on board. Um, it, I, you know, I could speculate as to what the impact had across the rest of the service in terms of the operating unit's abilities to conduct audits to update systems, uh, to conduct the basic business of the service, including customer service. 
um, in terms of quantifying that. And it's that last. Could you repeat that last part again, including customer service? Yeah. Thank you. Um, in terms of what Im what impact those reductions in uh, resources had on the tax gap would be a, a very complex and probably misleading connection to try to make. For one thing, the tax gap you know is influenced by a lot of different numbers, many of a lot of different influences. Um, some of them exogenous economic influences. Some of them uh, changes in obviously tax policy, tax code. Um, certainly, we can look at, and the, da the data, as I believe, is publicly available to show over time how it has reduced the number of audits uh, and, again, the number of uh, activities in, in uh, other IRS functions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Doc, uh, Mr. McTeague, the GAO report on the shrinking IRS enforcement workforce uh, has says that it's uh, resulted from years of decreased funding, retirements, and hiring freezes. How has decreased IRS enforcement staffing impacted audit effectiveness? Chairman Neal, I, I think um, we, we cited a lot of statistics, and I think the bottom line is across the board, audit rates have fallen, uh, not only for high wealth individuals, but uh, those making more than 200,000 a year, just across the board, all categories. Uh, we have made recommendations where IRS could increase efficiencies in regard to the audits that it undertakes, you know, looking at what return they get from looking at different types of re uh, tax returns for different types of taxpayers, and reallocate resources within the existing enforcement budget just to get, if you will, more bang for the buck. Uh, but short of that, as others have pointed out, I, you know, you can only do so much with what you have. At some point, if you do want to increase the audit rate, which has fallen dramatically you know, since 2010, then perhaps it is time to consider additional resources. IRS has achieved various efficiencies since 2010. Uh, you know, I also pointed to fluctuations in customer service, the level of telephone service, and you know, just more broadly, the level of service that they can provide to taxpayers to help them comply. So, Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Doggett had talked uh, extensively about some of the uh, issues regarding the President's uh, tax behavior. And, uh, this week in a newspaper, explosive newspaper article, said the President had losses totaling uh, over a billion dollars between 85 and 94, and that here are the self, one of the self-described most richest people in the world did not pay any taxes during a number of those years. Dr. Uh, Herndon, in light of these reports about um, the President's uh, 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 taxes and, and his finances. Do you believe Americans have a fair tax system? That's a complex question, obviously, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I will say that, uh, you know, as with regard to the, the recent claims, I have not seen data to be able to determine or assess the veracity for myself. With regard to the fairness of the tax system overall, um, you know, I know it is a, it a huge priority for this commissioner and this service to maintain a, a tax system that is as fair as possible. Uh, we certainly provide data to the operating units and to the commissioner as well as tools to make, to allow them and enable them to make much more dynamic and real-time assessments of the impacts of their uh, enforcement functions on the population and that I'm sure includes assessments of fairness. For me to make a determination of fairness, I think, would require a much deeper uh, examination of the, of the data at hand. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kelly? Thank you, Chairman, and thanks for holding the hearing today, and thank you all for being here. Uh, one of the things that we've talked about and one of the things that we, we look at and say, you know what, there, there are areas in the tax code that allow certain things to happen. And, you know, the, fixing this is an awful lot like talking about the weather because we need to do something about the weather, but really nobody does anything about it. So uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about, in fact, Representative Thompson and myself had uh, legislation pending to address a particularly egregious tax shelter that's <laughs> infecting our charitable conservation tax program. Now, despite Treasury listing these transactions as abusive shelters in 2016, 
the promoters continue to organize, promote, and sell these deals. More than $20 billion in unwarranted charitable deductions have been claimed to date. The Department of Justice says in its injunction suit, which was filed in December, that the U.S. will suffer irreparable injury if the defendants are not stopped. They haven't been stopped. Any of you have any opinions on that? Of why can't we go after what we already know? We know who they are, we know where they live, we know what they're doing, and yet we haven't been able to do anything about it. General Wood. Congressman, it obviously, if it's permitted by the Internal Revenue Code, people can attempt to take advantage of any opportunity they can to reduce their tax obligation. Again, the difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance. One is legal, one is not. I can say to you that uh, it's been brought to my attention that the IRS's large business and internal division does have a campaign ongoing to look at these conservation easements. Yeah, General, let me ask you, because I think the estimate of that is maybe a 20 percent recovery. I'm not certain of that figure. Okay. So. All right. So I, I can't imagine. I'm coming from the private sector. If you are looking at accounts receivable and you know they're out there and you can't get to them, I would, I would suggest that getting 20 percent back on what's already owed to you is a little bit ominous. So I, I, I keep looking at this stuff, not from a standpoint of sitting here being an elected member of Congress, but look, sitting here as a taxpayer and wondering, so why is it? Why is it that there's this huge gap? And I'm wondering at some point, because I have people come up to me, I'm with Mr. March, and I've never had anybody call me and, and ask me about, is it a possibility that I could maybe pay more taxes? Because I, I really am enjoying a lot of benefits. Most of the people that call us are scared to death that they've made a mistake and maybe going through some type of an audit. Is it more of a cultural problem with, with this? That in some cases, some people, they're just gonna cheat no matter what happens. It's, it's just part of their DNA. There's other people that don't mind paying their taxes because they receive great benefits. And so I wonder about all this. I know we're talking about all these different things that we can do, and we've even talked about, geez, if we just increased the budget to the IRS, would do quite well. I just, I just got these, these figures. So in 2010, the largest appropriations to the IRS was $12.1 billion. $6.6 billion went to enforcement programs, and the, and the enforcement uh, revenue collected was $57.6 billion. $12.1 billion. Total appropriation. In 2018, okay, the appropriation was $11.4 billion. So if I look back and I look at the return on that investment by hardworking American taxpayers, because that's who picks up the tab on everything, right? So back in 2010, you know what the return was? About a little bit, almost $9 uh, per dollar that was appropriated. That was on the $12.1 billion. In 2018, with $11.4 billion totally appropriated to it, we got back almost $11. So we spent less money, got a higher return on it. I just think that sometimes we worry so much and say, if we just threw more money at it, we'd be okay. I think the real answer is to, if we just improved the process, and if we could somehow make taxpayers feel that it's not just an obligation, it's a responsibility to fund this incredible government that we have. But you know what people tell me all the time? I don't mind paying my taxes if they just didn't waste so much money that I send them. So I think it's a complicated issue. I don't know that we can solve it here, but I do know this. Because of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we're seeing unprecedented growth in our economy. We're seeing an unprecedented opportunity across our country right now. So I think if we can keep our eye on what it is that really produces revenue, and it's Corporations that are profitable, they only pay taxes on profits, and working people. The rest of it is in fines and fees and borrowing, so I'd much rather see it come from people who are having great years as opposed to those that are being put under duress. Listen, I want to thank you all for what you do, because I don't think you're in this uh, for, for any other reason. You could make much more money in the private sector. I think you do it because of love of country and because you're patriotic. So thank you much for, so much for coming here today. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me begin by saying I, I identify very much with the comments from my friend, Mr. Doggett. Uh, and I heard Mr. Brady say that this has been a problem for decades, and it has. But I think any American who just reads the testimony here before us has a sense of what the problem is. I, I want to digress for one moment, and I'm sorry the Chairman's not here.
but I was really offended by his cheap shot at John Koskin. For any of the members of the committee who didn't have the privilege of working with John, Google him. And you will find in his resume nine different items that would represent a career of anybody on this dais. I've never heard his integrity impugned. He's been a, recruited by administrations, both Republican and Democrat, and he walked away from a private sector business that would have made him a billionaire. And instead, he devoted his life to public service. And I just found it offensive, not just today, but before, having people impugn his character. Get to know the man. That's one of the reasons we have the problem. We're just in never-never land here. The IRS has had its capacity to do its job attacked, there's no other way to say it, in the last eight years by the Republicans. Mr. Marchant said, well, it ought to be run like any other business. Absolutely. No business in America cuts its accounts receivable. They would go out and collect the bills that are due them. And the budget numbers we are given understates the challenge that they face. Because in that period of time, when we reduced over 20% the people who work for the IRS, and we've documented that they have a computer system that goes back to when we were in college, they have been challenged, not just by a tax code that is infinitely more complex, including the Republican gift with their lax tax bill, which is a nightmare for them. And there are more people in this country. Millions of more returns, more complexity, fewer people, and we've given up on enforcement. Now, people don't like to be audited, but I meet regularly with people in my district who are tax professionals, lawyers, accountants, financial planners, who, who wonder why the IRS doesn't audit anymore. And they're very candid that if you're not audited, it's easier to overlook income or to give yourself the benefit of the doubt for what you report. Mr. Wood pointed out that for international businesses, it makes sense to invest millions of dollars to avoid paying billions of dollars. And companies like General Electric, for years, had the finest tax law department in the country. They hired some of the all-stars away from the IRS or SEC. And when they challenged a tax matter, it was taking a squirt gun to somebody who's got a battleship. And it's no wonder they wore them down and they win, and the IRS often has to make compromises because they can't keep pace with what they're up against. And Congress, and specifically, I'm sad to say, my Republican colleagues made it worse. They've created two classes of taxpayers in this country. Anybody who could afford a lawyer, a, C a CPA, or a lobbyist was able, in many cases, to be able to characterize their income differently. And, by the way, pay less tax than people who weren't so armed on similar amounts of money. And poor people and lower, actually the bottom 90 percent, the IRS knows about them because they have to report all their income. The IRS has it. Higher level of complexity. Not so with people with more money who can forget. I think we ought to be serious about equipping the IRS to do its job. That's five trillion dollars over the next ten years that's available for public purposes. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Swackert. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay, um, now actually let's try to come up with some ideas of what we could do policy-wise, what we could do technology-wise um, that actually would help. Um, what, what, what could we actually do creatively? 
Um, uh, Mr. George, uh, you actually uh, touched on something about, like, in, in um, tip reporting a mechanism. What was the 10 percent number? Uh, let me make sure I give you a precise well, I'll give you a moment to look that up. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I walk through just a concept? And this is for Republicans and Democrats to think through. It's probably time we have an honest discussion about um, a distributive economy model, gig economy, whatever latest title you want to give it to. Should we allow, on a voluntary basis, if that's how you have to get there, an employer saying, your Lyft driver would you like us to withhold for you? Would that have a substantial impact on um, compliance? Mr. George. Yeah, sir, first of all, the 10% was the amount of underreported uh, income, at which we equate to be about $38 billion tip money alone. Okay. And, well, no, and, go, I'll let you finish. And as it relates to the gig economy, Uber and what have you, the one thing that Congress could definitely give and require is more information. And so this ties so, into but, but right now, um, are, most of these companies that would do any type of this sort of model are terrified of, if I give information, have I just moved into an employer-employee relationship instead of independent contractor? That's exactly. Should we actually do an update there and just do, and particularly with technology today, um, I, I know if, if it, it just, you know, in a previous life, a real estate office where your agents are independent contractors, um, but it would be pretty darn easy to say, yes, I would like you to withhold for me. Particularly at that point, it's a 1099K, depending on, because you might be paying quarterlies. But that's a simple policy change we could make here. Now we have to deal with all the folks who try to use the independent contractor employee relationship as, as, as leverage and a wedge. But if we want compliance. Well, Congressman, a, a quote, a figure that was provided by a previous witness bears repeating because it's so stark. And again, it's, there's such a high correlation between tax compliance and third party information reporting or withholding. When there is information reporting and withholding, as was noted, at the source, tax compliance is approximately 99%. Where there is- say, say, say that last sentence so everyone hears that again. Say that last sentence again. When there is information reporting and withholding at the source, tax compliance is approximately 99%. So, so for everyone here, if, if compliance is actually something, it's our goal, we're gonna have to do something that's a little uncomfortable for all of us and have an honest conversation of, is it time to modernize the, the services that can be provided in a independent contractor relationship? Just information, it's information and maybe a voluntary withholding. I just found you billions of dollars and you made people's lives easier. Um, in my last minute, I want to give you just a, a concept and, and I know you have very smart people uh, a couple of years ago, I sat down at a terminal of a company that does consumer data, and they let me log in. I had to sign all sorts of disclosures. They knew what type of ice cream I eat because of the data. There is stunning amount of commercially available data that they had the prediction of my income down to within hundreds of dollars because of the data. The reality of it is if we would allow the IRS to do much more of that type of data mining. It's not about an FTE count of employees. It's about technology and the access to that type of information to finding compliance. And we've talked about this for making, you know, tightening up the time frame for those that get an earned income tax credit. You can get rid of the delay mechanism if you'd let us bounce the data off that, hey, consumption looks like it matches the income, send them their, um, you know, negative income tax, but you could actually move that up the income threshold of data mining. There's a world out there that if, if we're ready to deal with the technology and deal with the modern economy, I think we can actually have a real impact on just taxpayer compliance. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman.
I thank the gentleman. With that, we will now proceed, based on precedent, to a two-for-one recognition in terms of the order in which members took their seats. So we will proceed with Mr. Kine from Wisconsin to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mateek, let me start with you. This is a statement because we're looking for some help right now. I've been informed by some constituents back home that we have a, uh, a malware problem with CCH software, making it hard for various organizations to file on time. Could you go back and direct whoever's in charge to see if that's getting fixed? Um, and maybe issue some guidance for these organizations, and if it's going to take longer, uh, consider an extension of the timeline so that we don't have this uh, problem. We can get you some more information on that, Mr. Mateek, uh, if you want. We'd be happy to work with you on that. Thank Great. you. Thanks. It just came to my attention within the last 24 hours or so. And let me just stay with you again. A few years back, you know, we had this uh, problem with 501c4 examinations, especially organizations that were involved almost exclusively in political operations. Uh, Mr. George knows it well. He conducted the investigation. My question for you today is, is the IRS now in such a submissive position that there's no examination, no audits taking place with 501c4 tax-exempt uh, organizations, which by statute, you may be reminded, have to be operating exclusively for the promotion of social welfare. But IRS regs now have changed that to primarily, which connotes a 51% or, or whatever. But can you tell us if the IRS is still looking at C4s to make sure that they're complying with uh, the requirements of tax-exempt status? It's directed to you, Mr. Mateek, yeah. I'm sorry, uh, I thought it was directed to someone else here. Uh, the IRS continues uh, to audit across the board, uh, both individuals as well as uh, 401c3 organizations. Audit rates have fallen. Uh, we did do a body of work. We issued about seven reports looking s specifically at how IRS selects organizations, taxpayers for audit. Uh, there was concern about whether or not certain groups were being targeted, whether or not uh, selection was being conducted in a fair way across taxpayers. Yeah, there's no question. We want fair and balanced review. I don't care about political affiliation. I just want to make sure that the C4s aren't just being ignored now because of the chill effect that went on with the previous. Mr. George, you're kind of nodding your head that the IRS is doing the right thing here? They, they are. They have, again, as he pointed out, and not as I would use the word aggressively doing it, but they are still doing it. Yeah. Well, let me stay with you for a second, because you mentioned your testimony about the gig economy right now. You used Uber as an example. Wouldn't the issuance of 1099 solve a lot of the underreporting problems that the, the answer, short answer is yes. But again, as it stands now, the IRS regulations only require people who earn $20,000 per year or more and have 200 or so rough engagements, and I, I would have to do a little more research to define what engage. That's not the actual. So is that a recommendation you're making to the committee that we ought to be taking a closer look at that and seeing uh, how we can kind of close that tax gap that's most developed? Most definitely, among others, yes. Okay, good. Mr. Wood, let me uh, uh, bring to your attention. You're probably aware, as most of us are, about the recent New York Times article that was dated May 8, 2019, titled Decade in Red, Trump Tax Figures Show Over $1 Billion in Business Losses. Now, as a former IRS agent and someone with substantial experience in examinations and audits, if you encounter a, a multiple entity organization like this that's racking up all these business losses, are there any particular red flags or concerns that you might have going into an examination process that you're going to be on the lookout for as to why we have such an unprecedented level of business losses and therefore no tax liability as a consequence? You're going to have to speak right into the mic. Um, let me clarify. I was never an IRS agent. I was a national office um, tax attorney. Um, but I have worked on primarily on large corporate issues. Um, the, it, it's pretty clear that if you, um, if you want to collect you know, the most taxes, there are people to go after, um, the high net worth and large corporations. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly um, what you're looking for in terms of a response here. Well, I'm not trying to give you an answer, but I'm just wondering, as, with your, ex, your experience in examinations and audits, when you see huge losses like this piling up, are there any particular red flags that you're going to be on the lookout for to, to kind of justify these losses? Well, there, I mean, there are lots of reasons. Uh, people say yeah, a corporation didn't pay taxes this year. They lost a lot of money. 
They may not pay taxes the next year because they're carrying over their losses from the prior year. That happens all the time. Yeah. There, there are certainly a lot of red flags. I think flags. we have a problem with uh, the certain preferences that are given in the code that relate to real estate developers in particular that we have to look at? Um, yeah, sure there are. Okay. Um, I, I guess I would start with taking a look at the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, I, I was looking at the number of pages this morning, and the Thomson Reuters version is more than 4,000 pages. The regulations are four or five times that. Yeah. This is a massively complex um, creation of the Congress, and and then you say, okay, figure it out. Yeah. And unfortunately, Chairman, I ask you now's consent to have the article inserted in the record at this time. So ordered. Thank you. Appreciate your response. Thank you. Thank the witness. Uh, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pasquale, is recognized to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wood, I have questions to open up with you, and if you'll make your answers brief, I think we'd all appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Mr. Wood, if I take out a loan from a bank uh, and I do not count the loan as income and pay taxes on it, correct? Yes. Okay. If I default on the loan, I think you know where we're going here. If we default on the loan and never repay it, is that discharge debt? That's what it's called, discharge debt, correct? Cancellation Consider, of indebtedness. Is that considered taxable income? Sure. That's right. So would it be lawful to deduct the losses from a loan on your taxes and not report the income from the discharge debt? Of course not. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Your answers are very brief. Now, because the wealthy and the powerful have teams of lawyers, and accountants to help them find tricks and loopholes to lower their tax bills. And with the IRS continually underfunded and lacking resources, it gives wealthy tax cheats a green light to avoid paying their fair share. This week is reported that President Trump lost over a billion dollars, as the gentleman from Wisconsin pointed out between 1985 and 1994. Losses that came from borrowed money that he never paid taxes on. Yet that is the law. You're not above the law, Mr. Wood. I'm not above the law. Name some people that are above the law in the United States. No one. So he deducted these losses through borrowed money and never reported the money he didn't pay back in default. So this means that he may not have paid taxes he owed. I say he may not have paid taxes he owed. He may have artificially inflated losses as his own to shield himself from taxation for years, possibly decades. Now, you and I can't conjecture about this. I can't conjecture about this. I'd like to know the facts to see what did happen, and that's what this is all about, Mr. Wood. If this information is correct, and Mr. Trump may have avoided paying income taxes on hundreds of millions of dollars in unreported income, I'll tell you something, my own thought, if I can say something politically here. Mr. Trump's base is going to be very angry when they find out that, yeah, they probably have been had, and so have a lot of Americans be had, because we are paying our fair share and some other people are not. So when someone, Mr. Wood, doesn't pay their property taxes in Patterson, New Jersey, where I lived all my life, I have to pay more taxes. You know why I have to pay more taxes? Because the bills don't decline because I'm not paying my fair share. Paying your fair share is an American thing. It's a good thing. And we have no idea whether the IRS ever audited or challenged Mr. Trump on it. We have no idea. We have conjecture. This committee, I believe, has taken steps to use our authority to obtain the president's tax returns and determine if the IRS is auditing him 
Mr. Trump and his Treasury Secretary are stonewalling us to find the Congress of the United States, the Article I branch of government. Does Trump, Mr. Trump, want to keep his taxes hidden to keep us from closing the very loopholes he has used for decades to avoid paying taxes? Why on earth would my brothers and sisters on the other side of the aisle choose to turn a blind eye and continue to shield the president? Because someday, somebody's going to say, what did you do when we were looking into this? Did you stand up or did you cower behind the desk? Voters in my district don't get to choose when and how they pay taxes. I don't know about where you live, Mr. Wood. I was born in Patterson, so. <laughs> I haven't been there in a while. With one T. Uh, all your previous testimony is now excluded from the record. <laughs> Thank the gentleman. I hope that's not counted. Can I just finish my comments? If it's not about Patterson, yes. <laughs> so neither, neither should our chief executive or anyone else. We cannot sanction two sets of laws for the powerful and for the rest of us. We need one set of laws, and that's what this is about. That's the bottom line. Thank the gentleman for his inquiry. And let me recognize the gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Wolarski, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to our witnesses as well. We held an oversight subcommittee hearing about a year and a half ago called the Taxpayer Experience. At that hearing, I highlighted the story of an 80-year-old farmer in my district. He received a letter from the IRS saying that even though they hadn't found anything wrong, that he was subject to an audit, random statistical audit. The audit only took a few days, but this couple had to spend $1,900 defending themselves, countless hours pulling together documents and traveling to their CPA's office to meet with the IRS auditor. All the while, they felt the burden was on them to prove their innocence instead of the auditor to prove any guilt. Now we hear the GAO raise concerns in a number of reports about the IRS's timeliness in using the data collected through its national research program, which includes statistical audits like the one that my constituent completed. It's incredibly concerning that the IRS would cause so much havoc in the lives of innocent Americans in the name of research only to let that research collect dust. It's yet another example of the problem of bureaucracy running amok. Mr. Herndon, does your division currently have a comprehensive strategy for sharing all that data that's collected from the National Research Program audits so it can actually be helpful to IRS examination divisions? If not, are you currently working on a plan or strategy in, in response to GAO's recommendation? Certainly. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> a couple of parts to my response. Uh, the first would be that you know, we are always mindful of the burden that any audit, including NRP audits, place on taxpayers. It is certainly front, uh, front of mind for all of us. Um, we work very hard to apply that data to the techniques and tools that we develop in my organization. Um, we use that data on a dynamic basis to update statistical models, which we believe net-net reduce the burden on taxpayers by reducing the likelihood of false positive audits. Uh, so our, our hope is that it, overall we are doing the best that we can to select the right audits uh, and to reduce the burden on taxpayers who are and are trying to be compliant. Um, unfortunately, the only way for us to collect the data that we need to conduct those types of statistical analyses uh, is through a random sampling technique, which the NRP employs. Um, that being said, you know, we are, with every iteration, attempting to revise our procedures to not only reduce the burden on taxpayers, but uh, to reduce the total number that we need from the sample to accomplish our objectives. Um, so I very much understand the nature of your question, and uh, please rest assured that it is very much a, a strategic priority for us. So you, you are currently working on a plan or a strategy in response to the GAO's recommendation? Yes, we are. Um, Do you we, have any kind of a time estimate of when that would be complete? Uh, I believe later this year. I don't have a specific time estimate. Some of our uh, deliverables have slipped with the shutdown, but uh, we are actively working on a plan uh, to coordinate those data assets more effectively with the operating units. Uh, Mr. George? I'd like to get your views because the last time we got an update on the tax gap was April of 2016. 
and we may be getting an update next month. Do you think it's possible for the IRS to give us more frequent or interim updates, which TIGTA recommended in 2013? It is difficult for them to do so. The process does take too long, uh, Congresswoman. It really does. Again, it's been over 10 years. Um, it is not limited, in fairness, to the IRS, to just this nation. Uh, the International Monetary For For um, Fund recently issued a report on the tax gap in the European Union. It, too, relies on dated information. It just takes quite a while to collect this. Yeah. And, and in closing, Mr. Herndon, if it's really necessary to subject random taxpayers to audit, I would just ask that you remember the power the IRS yields over American taxpayers. Consider the fear that the word audit strikes in the hearts of taxpayers, even though they know they've done nothing wrong. Think of the 80-year-old farmer in my district, and if you're going to put Americans through this process, the information better be put to good use to improve your operations. Because if you're putting these poor people through this, you can be sure you'll be hearing from us again. And in reference to another comment, um, as we've been sitting here today, we do get a lot of phone calls from a lot of law-abiding, tax-paying, hard-working Americans. So I would just ask that if we're going through this process, let's use the information and make it worth that process. Yeah. Thank you, I, Mr. Chairman. I couldn't agree more. Thank I you. I yield back. We thank the gentlelady. And with that, let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois to inquire, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I also want to thank our witnesses. You know, I'm concerned by the fact that the Internal Revenue Service fraud filters seem hyper-focused on tax credits that help working taxpayers, like those using the Earned Income Tax Credits and the CTC, and are less focused on benefits taken by higher income earners. In addition, these flags have extremely high false positive rates of about 80 percent. So, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to submit for the record this uh, ProPublica article that document these patterns of audits being overfocused on poor areas. So ordered. In particular, the study found that the counties with the highest rate of audits were all predominantly African-American rural counties in the Deep South. It seems like the system is not focused on taxpayer burden or higher level earners. For example, it seems reasonable to include matching variables for K-1s or foreign bank account reporting in order to examine underpayment by wealthier taxpayers rather than simply burdening the poor with an 80 percent false positive rate. Director Matihi, could you tell us why there is a high rate of false positives and what can be done to improve the filters so that even wealthier taxpayers pay what they owe? Congressman, I will defer to uh, Dr. Herndon for more specifics in terms of the false positives given the research that he's conducted. However, I would say that this dovetails with the issue that we have been discussing quite a bit today, and that is the, the prevalence or lack thereof of information reporting on income, business income, and uh, income sources of higher earning uh, individuals. So there's, IRS has less information to feed into their systems, their models, their filters to detect noncompliance at that level. Uh, and you're correct that uh, according to IRS statistics, those who are receiving an earned income tax credit are over four times more likely to be audited than those who do not. So there is a discrepancy there. Uh, it's important to have audit coverage across the board to ensure that all taxpayers, number one, are being treated fairly and are, you know, fulfilling their tax okay. obligations. Dr. Hearn, could you 
respond to that? Certainly. Um, first of all, I, I can't really confirm or deny the statistics other than to say that I don't know where the number of an 80 percent false positives in the EITC uh, audit would have come from. In general, our audit, our false positives in the audit uh, universe is extremely low. Uh, that being said, the data that we revise, uh, as my colleague uh, commented on, and the filters that we update on a regular basis are provided uh, to the business operating units as an input into how they determine uh, their overall exam plans. So there are a number of other factors that the business units take into consideration in a very complex and dynamic constellation of priorities that they have to balance, uh, and it would be inappropriate for me to comment on, on how they made that kind of a Thank you. Assessment. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I'm reading from this ProPublica article that says, Humphreys County, Mississippi, seems like an odd place for the Internal Revenue Service to go hunting for tax cheats. It's a rural county in the Mississippi Delta, known for its catfish farms, and more than a third of its mostly African-American residents are below the poverty line. But according to a new study, it is the most heavily audited county in America. Inspector George, have you seen any information or data I that have a, suggests? With the limited time that I have, I just want to make three quick points, sir. Uh, the most EITC audits that the IRS conducts are in states with the highest number of claimants. And those tend to be, of course, larger population states, California, Texas, Florida, New York, and Illinois. Um, we are at TICTOR in the process of reviewing the selection criteria and filters that are used by the IRS as part of our overall filing season audit. But as for the states that you cited um, in your, your, your um, question, uh, Mississippi does have the highest percentage of EIT claims in terms of the percentage of the population, but it's not the highest number of actual claims. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So there may be a better way of doing that. Yeah. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Washington State, Ms. Del Bene, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I'd like to start and ask for unanimous consent to introduce into the record a, um, a report from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities regarding funding for IRS enforcement. So ordered. Thank you. Um, and following up on that, um, Inspector General George, the IRS's funding has declined and enforcement staffing levels have decreased by nearly 40 percent since 2010. Um, you talked about this a little bit. To what extent has that decline in funding uh, and staffing affected the IRS's enforcement efforts? And can you talk about how you think about how we should allocate increased funding effectively in order to decrease the tax gap? Um, uh, Congresswoman, the IR, it's, I, I hate to again use something along these lines, but it's almost a zero-sum game. So if they have less money that they can use for enforcement, if tax law changes uh, require uh, more attention to the 800 telephone uh, number to make sure that people who call in with questions on how to file their taxes as a result of those uh, tax law changes, the resources come from a different pot within the IRS. So there's less money for enforcement officials and what have you. Um, a very interesting factoid is that the highest amount of revenue that was paid 2000, in 2007, it was $57 billion. It's gone down since then, uh, $57 billion because of uh, lack of resources and having uh, to make those tough choices. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to cover a little bit, you brought up um, earlier tip compliance and, and um, that tips were one of the areas where um, you saw a big tax gap. Um, since the IRS's enforcement in this area obviously is limited, to what extent should we consider innovative ideas and incentives to make sure that we voluntarily encourage better tip reporting? Well, this is one of those areas, uh, though, where 
additional money is not necessarily needed because what's happening is that the IRS employees assigned to this area are being used in a way that doesn't necessarily bring in more revenue. They're right now more concerned about the agreements that these particular entities, restaurants, have to uh, provide information uh, and to deduct amounts to the IRS as opposed to actually going in to see if those amounts are accurate and if the relevant amounts of money are being pr produced. So it's, it's not that they need more money and more people necessarily, they need to reprioritize their actions. Are these the track agreements that you're talking about? These or? are the agreements that, yes. Mm -hmm. The tip reporting alternative <coughs> commitment agreements? That's correct. Um, so if tip reporting can be improved by just 10%, um, I have a number here, more than $23 billion would be collected over 10 years, is that correct? Again, assuming everything were to work out the way it uh, is envisioned, yes, but uh, yeah, who knows what would happen. It could be more, it could be less. But um, so any incremental improvement that we would have in addressing it could actually have a significant impact on revenue and on the tax gap then. Any favorable addressing of this both by Congress as well as by the IRS would result in more resources and more resources. Um, do others have feedback or comments on TIP reporting or what we can do there? Yes, Congresswoman, I, I would just add two things. First of all, we've talked a little bit about 1099K reporting, credit card payments, uh, third-party settlement companies, and I know IRS has been looking at the information that's been collected in the 1099Ks uh, to come up with predictive models to help identify where noncompliance may occur, tip income, tip income being one of those areas. The second point that I would make is this is an area where I would underscore the need for Congress to provide IRS with the authority to regulate paid tax preparers. Uh, we did an undercover study back in 2014, and tipping income, cash income, was one of the areas that often went underreported. And what we found is many of the tax preparers were encouraging innocent or willing taxpayers to understate their cash income. You know, they, we heard various stories that IRS would never catch you or it'll get your employer in trouble. So we very strongly feel that paid tax preparers need additional education, competency testing. In states that have such regulations, such as Oregon, uh, tax returns are something like 72% more likely to be correct than across the board. So we feel strongly in that area. We think that could make a difference. Thank you. My time's expired. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Rice, to inquire. I have a bill that deals with tax reporting and the gig, the gig economy and that would, I think, assist in tax administration. And I wanted to talk about that, but I, uh, after some of the comments by Mr. Pasquel and others, I felt like I had to uh, comment briefly on this committee's request for the president's tax returns. You know, uh, it is true that this committee, strictly under the statute, has the power to ask for an individual's tax return. And I was just asking the staff earlier uh, whether or not they can recall ever, this committee ever, asking for an individual's tax returns, and they cannot. It, you know, this, this power is granted to, uh, to allow us to make sure the tax code is being administered properly and to use this as a weapon against a political foe is a gross abuse of that power. I, I think that if we are going to use this power this way, we need to go one of two ways. We should either, uh, we should either move to strike this power from the code if we are unable to restrain ourselves from abusing it or we should just go ahead and adopt a procedure that any time we have a political foe that disagrees with us, we need to just go ahead and ask for their tax returns so we can scour them to find embarrassing information. You know, the, this uh, uh, Mueller commission has scoured the president's financial information, including his tax returns for the last two years, 19 lawyers did it, and they didn't fa find any, uh, any crime. And here, we're gonna take it on ourselves because we disagree with the president as a politician,
and we are going to ask for his tax returns so that w for no other reason other than we're going to scour them to try to find politically damaging information. I think this is a gross abuse of authority, and I think that uh, I'm embarrassed that this committee would do that. Now, moving on to my, uh, on to my proposal for this gig economy. Mr. George, you said that uh, 90 in a case where the income is reported, 90 percent you have 90 percent compliance, correct? Yeah, 99 percent when it's both withheld at the source and reported to the IRS. It's a 99 percent. And then, and then, as a tax lawyer and a CPA practicing for 25 years, I often have the problem of, not often, but on occasion, several times in my career, I had a, a client come to me, and the IRS had, after they had been treating people as independent contractors for decades, the IRS come in and reclassify these people, and that they had gone back for 10 years and assessed liability and penalties and interest, and the amount of the liability that they handed these taxpayers a bill for was enough to put them out of business. I mean, they simply couldn't pay the liability that, that was presented to them. Uh, Mr. Hood, can you characterize for me the, the test that the IRS uses to uh, determine somebody who's an independent contractor for an employee? Are you, are you familiar with that test? Is it Mr. Hood? No, it's Mr. Wood, and Mr. no, Wood? I'm not familiar with any of that. Is anybody on the dais familiar with the test the IRS uses? Well, I can tell you it has 28 parts. It's a 28-factor test that the IRS uses to determine whether somebody's an independent contractor or an employee. In other words, it's incredibly, it's stupidly complicated. So my gig act would very much simplify the uh, classification and would uh, provide for expanded reporting. If, if we had expanded reporting, uh, Mr. George, do you believe that uh, we would have better compliance with participants in the gig economy? Oh, no, there's no question about that, sir. Okay, uh, I, I have, is anybody here familiar with IRS technology, uh, the technology issues the IRS faces? Somewhat. Uh, Mr. McTie, uh, I understand that the IRS still uses COBOL running programs. Are they, even if we have these reporting things improved, is the IRS really able to match up the reporting with the returns? Have we got that level of technology right that we should, we really should have had it right 40 years ago, but is it right today? Are we, are we at the point where we can match up 1099s with tax returns successfully? Congressman, I, that's a very good question. I think actually the IRS has made significant progress in updating various systems with modern technology relational databases uh, to do just what you're talking about. And I, I, I would mention the uh, W-2 systemic verification that IRS implemented because uh, the act that Congress passed to speed up the uh, deadline on the W-2s so that IRS can start matching and checking returns before uh, refunds go out. So they do have the technology. The, uh, the old technology that you're referring to is still of concern because that is uh, uh, some of their core systems. The individual master file does have decades old technology, Cobalt language, various uh, generations of assembly language, and you know the IRS needs to move quickly. They've just issued a six year plan to try to once again uh, uh, migrate that system. And then uh, the issue that we're talking about is a lot of the downstream systems that interface with that individual master file uh, do use the modern technology, but you know there's a critical risk there in that core function falling apart. Thank, Thank the gentleman. You. With that, let me recognize the former Revenue Commissioner of the State of California, Ms. Chu, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, closing the tax gap has been an issue that has been very important to me. You see, prior to Congress, I was a member of the nation's only elected tax board, the Board of Equalization, which collected taxes for the state of California. When I was on the board, we had a tax gap of about $8.5 billion. So we developed an aggressive series of 22 actions in the areas of reporting, auditing, 
and sharing of information across agencies and jurisdictions, as well as educational outreach to businesses. I, in fact, did a tax amnesty bill, which allowed people to come forward and pay their liabilities without penalty for a two-month period. It was supposed to bring in $300 million, but ultimately brought in $4.8 billion. But all of this requires personnel, and that is why on the federal level, I'm so concerned about the declining resources of the IRS. So Inspector General George, the IRS budget has been repeatedly cut since Republicans took, off, uh, took over the House in 2011. The cuts have forced IRS to curtail some of its most basic functions that would seem to be the easiest way to target uh, for more enforcement. Specifically, I'd like to take a closer look at non-filers. Non-filer accounts for $32 billion of this tax gap. And these are taxpayers who are required to file a return and haven't done so in a timely manner. In a 2016 report looking into IRS's processes for dealing with non-filers, your office found that taxpayers who filed extensions but did not end up filing a return were actually not at all pursued by the IRS for tax year 2012 and 2013. We know that individuals who file an extension generally have a higher income than the average taxpayer. Ultimately, it seems that the IRS determined that they could, couldn't follow up on these expired extensions because of a severe lack of resources. Furthermore, more recent data shows that new investigations of non-filers dropped from 2.4 million in 2011 all the way down to 362,000 in 2017. That's 85% less than what we had in the original year. So it's clear that this lack of pursuance of high-income non-filers is costing the federal government millions and millions of dollars. So can you tell us what you found when you took a closer look at IRS's strategy to address non-filers over the years? Major gap, low-hanging fruit on the part of the Internal Revenue Service, and, but to their credit, while that program was suspended for a while, it has been renewed. And so, not to the extent that it should be, it still needs a lot of ramping up, and it could use additional resources, but they are now addressing those problems. Are they addressing it to the extent that they were before? We're, we're going to look at that, and I'll be able to give a fuller response uh, at a future date to Congressman. And what can Congress uh, do to ensure that uh, the agency is going after these non-filers and in, in, to the extent that it was? Oversight hearings such as what you're having today, and there is no question, if the IRS did have additional resources that were devoted to that purpose, they could do more. Then let me ask about another resource issue, which is audits. Um, the IRS conducted 675,000 fewer audits in 2017 than in 2010, which is a drop of 42%. And these inadequate enforcement of the tax laws disproportionately harms lower income taxpayers and a typically regressive effect. It's reported that the IRS audit operations now mainly focuses on correspondence audits, which are conducted entirely through mail and focus on, on straightforward errors, basically, in their returns. Um, so field audits have gone way down, but it's a more comprehensive audit conducted in person, and they typically uh, are, uh, impact high net worth individuals and large corporations with complicated filings, which then would yield higher dollar amounts. Since we know that these wealthy filers contribute the highest dollar amount to the tax gap, why is the IRS focusing more heavily on less productive correspondence audits? And what are the consequences to this? I, I referenced this earlier, uh, easier to, to accomplish is one reason, again, car mailing a letter versus having someone spend hours sitting across the table with uh, someone with very complicated returns. Uh, it's a course benefit analysis on their part, uh, Congresswoman. Um, I, as I stated before, audits are the most White. productive way White. for the Internal Revenue Service to address the underpayment and underreporting of taxes, but it is time consuming and expensive. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans, to inquire.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for this hearing. I'm going to kind of follow up on my, my, my colleague from Pennsylvania, I mean from California. Our tax system is founded on the idea that all taxpayers should pay what they owe. You would agree with that, Mr. George, wouldn't you? Yes, definitely. Okay. So if, if that is, and you said earlier that you go where the money is, and you mentioned Willie Sutton, which I think was arrested in Pennsylvania, Mr. Chairman, and put in jail at Eastern State Penitentiary. So can you please discuss some of the recommendations you have made regarding auditing coverage of high earners? And has the IRS implemented any of those recommendations? Uh, they have implemented some of them. And once again, further use of the automated reporting system and having that tool, which is very effective if used correctly, devoted to high-income taxpayers. Um, you, th there is a very interesting quirk that is in the IRS's policies, which, for whatever reason, lists the threshold for high-income taxpayers at 200,000. Correct. Yes. And so we would, rec and would have recommended that they raise that so that that also would capture, again, more of the high-income people. And uh, there are, are an assortment of them, sir, beyond what I've just mentioned, that if you would permit me to provide you in a follow-up uh, correspondent, correspondence, I'd appreciate that. I, w I would appreciate, you know, obviously submitting that to yeah, the chairman, the chairman would allow that. that. But I think that going back to the premise, as I said, that if we want to ensure, and, and this committee has the oversight responsibility of ensuring that every taxpayer pays what they owe. I mean, clearly, that's what this discussion is all about, uh, tax gap and tax compliance. And that's why we're asking the questions that we're asking today to really understand the, the, the center message that people are responsible, uh, that they should pay their taxes. So I, I stress that, that part. There's another question I want to ask then. Can you, um, in terms of expanding the, the gig economy, what are your findings regarding the types of jobs associated with the sector <laughs> of the economy and this uh, contribution to the tax gap? I'm not sure I followed you. Well, in your findings regarding the types of jobs associated with the sector of the economy <laughs> and its contribution to the tax gap. You mentioned sort of the gig economy. Yes. So th the question I'm asking is, what portion, you sort of mentioned uh, Uber or Lyft, that's one sector that you mentioned. Right. Right, okay. So to what degree do you think they're contributing to the tax gap? We don't have actual numbers. I've actually requested that we see if we could uh, monetize, you know, the exact uh, amount, but th what it really boils down to, you have two issues here. One again is the reporting threshold, it's 20,000 or more, and having certain other requirements related to it. But then you also have the issue, as was pointed out, whether someone's characterized as an independent contractor or, or not, and that has more implications just other than just for tax purposes. It's whether the person's entitled to health insurance, and, and and whether or not Social Security uh, uh, contributions are made, uh, and whether or not, as it relates to payroll taxes, whether there's a contribution from uh, the employer and it, uh, or solely the responsibility of the em employee. The other area I'm going to get to real quick. Um, you also mentioned you re in, in your report, report um, that the international tax gap are you aware of the reasons why the IRS has not come up with a, an estimate in terms of that to the equation? And how important is the international tax, get, tax gap in understanding the big, bigger picture of this issue? It's one of the black holes in the entire discussion of the international, of, of the tax gap. While a component, a very small component of the international tax gap is, is a, portion, a part of what the IRS re reports as, you know, the tax gap of 300 plus or, you know, 400 plus billion dollars. It is not, it, it omits a very large percentage of money 
that would be a push, a part of, or assigned to the international tax gap, which is literally, again, the amount of money not paid in full on time by international organizations with tax obligations to the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Arrington, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and panelists. Um, I'm a law and order guy. Uh, doesn't do any good to pass laws if we can't enforce or that we won't enforce or don't enforce. And I know there's a lot of commentary on why things aren't being accomplished the way we would like, all of us. A $400 billion nuts, big one. And we've got to reduce that. Um, and I know you guys are, are all coming forward with ideas and strategies on, uh, to, to that end. Mr. Wood, the commissioner's not here. Um, he's the CEO. Give me the, give me the three things that our commissioner appointed by the president, CEO of the IRS. Give me two or three things that he's going to do to ensure that we enforce the law and that we uh, get the monies that are due to uh, our government to run the people's business. Uh, well, as a retiree, I can't tell you what the commissioner is going to do. I can tell Dr. You. Herndon, let me just let me get Dr. Herndon. What about you? What, what, tell me the commissioner's plan to um, to bring in the revenue that is due the uh, this this great country and our government. I mean, the one part <clears throat> of his plan that I think he's been vocal about, and that I think a number of us agree on, is that the IRS could do more with more resources. Um, short of that, uh, I, I think you should hear from the commissioner himself as to what his priorities are. Has he told you what they are? I mean, no, not, not directly. We've has discussed he told them in leadership meetings and <clears throat> things of that sort, but I mean, he has a number of priorities right now that he's working through, and I think he'd be happy to talk to you about them. As the commissioner for the IRS, I would hope that the vision and game plan would be understood by every single employee every single employee, um, because $400 billion is a lot of money owed to this government so that we can run it uh, for the people who spend their hard-earned uh, tax dollars to make sure that we are enforcing the laws that we pass on their behalf. Mr. George, <clears throat> the, um, uh, I read where the high audit potential strategy, that is there's a method, a methodology of identifying uh, audits that will have the greatest uh, return on our time and resources. But in fact, I think a recent report stated that or found that that wasn't necessarily the case, that uh, in too many, maybe in the majority of cases, they're not returning um, for high potential. They're actually returning as if they were low potential audits. Is that, is my statement accurate? Did I read that right? And what do we do to fix that, uh, that process? Actually, though, we found that when audits are um, conducted of high-income people, the, the return on, of, on investment, to use that expression, is high. So when they do audit high-income people, they tend to make assessments uh, of amounts due that are larger and are worth the effort. So let me just make sure I didn't misread it. I, I thought I read where you, there were high audit potential audits, those identified for maximum return on time and resources that weren't returning that way. If that's not true, I'll move on to the next question, but that's what I thought I read. I, th I thought that was one of your audits 2019 this year. You know, I've just been informed that I may have misunderstood you. If you're talking about the DIF, and that is the uh, formula that the IRS uses to determine who gets audited and who does not get audited, the DIF does not discriminate um, uh, um, uh, functions. It, it, it does not work as well. So, you know, I have my subject matter expert here. I'll follow up with you after the hearing. Yeah, um, so don't want to put you on the spot. I know you can't know everything. Up. Let me change. Uh, subject for, for Mr. Mateague in my final less than a minute now. I, I, I you know, you've got to enforce the law, and, and, I, and I was at a regulatory agency. We examined banks at the FDIC uh, back in the Bush uh, uh, era, and uh, if we didn't have the examiners, we couldn't, we couldn't uh, figure out which banks were safe and sound. I mean, it is part of doing your job. I don't, I don't disagree with that. 
Um, but I don't want to throw good money after bad. I want to make sure you're utilizing technology. And I've heard some reports that that's not happening and that you're having problems. Um, and that uh, this high risk list that you mentioned, Mr. Matig, you said of a couple of the five factors that were, uh, the, they don't, there's not an action plan that's being followed through and their monitoring is, is weak. I mean, uh, we've got to make sure that those things are happening at a, at a minimum. I'm running out of time, so. Well, let, we'll let the witness finish. Okay, <clears throat> Mr. Matig. Would you comment on that, please, on those two components of uh, criteria for high-risk agencies? Sure, sure. You know, given, given the, the uh, scope of the tax gap, I mean, it, t it touches over 150 million individual taxpayers on the individual side, corporations. We talk about international tax compliance as well. So the scope of the tax gap is huge. And so uh, you're absolutely right uh, in terms of having an action plan and monitoring efforts we have identified various aspects where we think IRS could do a little bit better job. It's not that they're not doing anything in those areas. Sure. And in fact, uh, if you look at the first criteria, the leadership commitment, we give IRS very high, high marks in terms of their commitment and dedication, you know, from the top of the agency on down, uh, focused on this issue. So uh, IRS understands the problem. Uh, as I said in my oral opening statement, uh, we believe that the tax gap has to be attacked on multiple fronts, multiple strategies, enforcement, taxpayer service, uh, tax simplicity. All of those would help the tax gap. So it, it's hard to point to one particular action. You can point to one particular action that IRS is not doing to- My, my time has expired. Thank gap. you, sir. Thank the gentleman. And let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schneider, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and I want to thank uh, the witnesses for being with us today and for your important testimony. As has been repeatedly noted today, Americans are bearing the significant burden of the tax gap. This committee has a responsibility to ensure the public has confidence that our tax code is being administered fairly. That goes to the core of what it, this hearing is about. Our constituents are expected to pay their taxes in full and on time. But with the declining in IRS funding and a 40 percent decrease in enforcement staffing levels, it's no surprise some powerful interests and greedy individuals are trying to dodge their obligations. One area of concern for me is the cost to the American taxpayers from supposed charitable and social welfare, welfare organizations that get special tax preferences and then abuse those preferences for personal gain or self-dealing. I'm also concerned that such egregious behaviors are not being adequately pursued by the IRS. Uh, Inspector General George, if I can, what I'd like to do is just raise a few scenarios that could represent improper behavior by a tax-exempt organization and get just a, a yes or no answer if you think the activity is troublesome or would worry what would warrant further investigation. Uh, the first one, let's suppose a board member of a nonprofit organization owns a company that sells millions of dollars in products and services back to that same nonprofit organization and at, at inflated prices. Do you find this troubling? Yes or no? It's concerning. Uh, how about uh, a senior executive and a top fundraiser for a nonprofit organization has a stake in a, a media company that the nonprofit directs millions of dollars in business to? Should this activity raise any flags? It would raise questions, sir. What if the newly selected president of the board of directors of a nonprofit organization subsequently received a contract with more than a million dollars from the nonprofit's largest vendor within days of assuming his new position? Would this create a likely conflict of interest? It, it depends on the circumstances, but that potentiality so exists. Something that would, you would look at. Yes. Uh, last scenario, let's say the CEO of a nonprofit charged hundreds of thousands of dollars of lavish uh, travel, lavish travel expenses to the nonprofit's largest vendor without adequate documentation. Would that be something that the IRS should look into? Definitely. Okay. So um, and thank you, Inspector General. But uh, I'll ask you again. We laid out four scenarios uh, just presented. If they were actual uh, cases, would these warrant further investigation of possible abuse of the nonprofit tax exempt organization? Yes. Uh, thank you. I agree. Uh, but as you might have surmised, these scenarios are not hypothetical. There are allegations of self dealing within the NRA, a 501c4 organization with 5 million members. It's incredibly disturbing to see these allegations and to think that NRA executives are possibly misappropriating their donors' contributions and abusing their nonprofit status for personal gain. And the American taxpayer is subsidizing the bill. This morning, I sent a letter to the IRS commissioner, commissioner and I sent a copy to you, 
requesting an investigation into these allegations and whether they warrant reconsideration of the NRA's tax exempt status. I would appreciate your attention to this matter. More broadly, in 2018, the office published a report, your office published a report on the process for investigating referrals of impermissible activity by tax exempt organizations. Given the follow up sensor report and your interactions with IRS management, do you believe there are adequate policies and procedures currently in place to enable the IRS to examine improper conduct, conduct by tax exempt organizations and whether the IRS has sufficient information and resources to uncover abuse? They instituted extensive uh, revisions to their existing policies and the, uh, the most recent review of it shows that they are following those new policies and we will have not, I'll eventually we'll follow up again to ensure that mistakes aren't being made, but as of now, they are taking the steps that they committed to us that they would take. Okay, but one of the concerns in the, in the report was that um, referrals of uh, potential abuse of nonprofit organizations hadn't been followed up. Have those been subsequently followed up upon? Uh, we, some, some, uh, we did. Most of them, have, I believe, have been provided. There were some that weren't, but a lot were. Okay. Um, and then, as we look forward, what more can be done to address the tax exempt sector to ensure honest, hardworking Americans aren't paying the price for the tax cheats and organizations that get subsidized on special tax, tax pre preferences and then violate our tax code. You know, the, uh, and again, and this may not necessarily be a direct response to your question, Congressman, but there's an important issue that really hasn't been addressed at all, Mr. Chairman, Congressman. We're, we're, the underground economy and the impact that it has on the tax gap is just unknown but just use your imagination as to what that is. So, I mean, obviously, underground economy, we're suggesting illegal activity, but not necessarily illegal activity, but activity that is completely done in cash, uh, again, using whether it's a Bitcoin um, exchange or whether it's some other or just cash, that is not even being considered in this overall discussion. Great, thank you. And with permission, I'd like to submit for the record the articles from the New York New Yorker, April 17th and May 7th. Discussing. So ordered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Swazi, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. We appreciate your testimony very much. I want to get back to the very basic concept here. We think that there's over $400 billion a year that the federal government is due from taxpayers and different entities that they're not getting. And that money comes from people that don't file at all, comes from people who file, who underpay, and it comes from people who don't even file at all. And we think that if we could bring this money into the federal government, we could reduce the deficit without affecting the otherwise people who are legally paying their taxes. So I just want to read a quote from an article I just read. Uh, it says, people who evade taxes are not just cheating the government. They are also stealing from their neighbors who are following laws and regulations. Cutting IRS spending, as policymakers have done in recent years, is penny wise and pound foolish. While it's unreasonable to expect to receive all taxes that are owed the government, the IRS could do far more if they had the resources. And I think that's what you just talked, to, talked about before, Dr. Herndon. He said, we need more resources. It's very simple. We don't have enough resources to do the audits, to collect the money, from the people that aren't paying their taxes. So we need to go after people and make sure that they're paying their fair share of taxes. And we need to do that not because we need to catch every single person, but if people feel like there's a threat of enforcement, then a lot of other people will comply. So would you agree with that, Mr. George? Not only would I agree with it, even though it's dormant now, the Tax Oversight Board, which was also created under the Restructuring and Reform Act of 1998, they did a study, sir, and again, it's, it's somewhat dated, but. The vast majority of people, when posed with the following question, do you believe that you should pay all the taxes that you owe 99 plus? Or and people do pay most of their taxes. But There's some people that aren't and some entities that aren't. The moment they changed the question and it was phrased, you learn your neighbor down the block is not paying the taxes that she owes. Should you, do you still believe that you should pay everything that you owe? And the numbers fell dramatically. Right. So I think, would everyone just a yes or no, do you agree that we need more resources for the IRS in order to go after and do a better job auditing? You agree, Mr. McTeague? 
I would agree. Uh, you know, we've looked at, you know, I we think the yes IRS no. could yeah. be more efficient. I, I, w one important point, uh, IRS also serves to educate taxpayers and help them comply. 85% of taxpayers comply voluntarily, and a 1% change in that voluntary compliance rate would equate to $30, $35 billion per year. But we year. want more people to comply, so we need resources to help do that. Dr. Herndon, you already told us yes. Mr. Wood, I'm going to assume you agree, so I don't waste any more time on the things I want to say. <laughs> so. Right now, the IRS has fewer than 10,000 revenue agents. Is that correct? Does anybody know the answer to that? Fewer than 10,000 revenue agents. That is correct. Did you know that the last time that the IRS had fewer than 10,000 revenue agents was in 1953, when the economy was one-seventh of the size that it is today? So there's less than 10,000 revenue agents today. The last time we had less than 10,000 revenue agents was in 1953 when the economy was one-seventh of what it is today. In fact, there are 675,000 less audits today than there were in 2010. And so let me just give you some examples. 32 billion people a year that are supposed to file their tax returns don't file their tax returns. And in the old days, well, old days, 2010, we did 2.4 million investigations of the people who didn't file. 2.4 million. You know what it is today? 360,000. Now that's billions of dollars we could bring in. Did you know that when someone doesn't pay the taxes they owe, if nobody does anything about it, within 10 years, they're off scot-free? In the old days, we used to bring in $8.3 billion. Now we bring in, no, this is not the right number. I'm sorry. In 2010, $482 million were forgiven in people that owed taxes that 10 years expired. In 2017, $8.3 billion were forgiven in taxes that were owed that nobody went after for 10 years. So we just simply, I think, need the resources. We heard you have 1,600 less revenue agents today than you did before. Let's say that we had 1,600 revenue agents and they cost us $100,000 a piece with their salaries and benefits, you know, their entry level employees, and they get health insurance and retirement, all that, $100,000 a piece. 1,600 times 100,000 is $160 million. You told us before that each revenue agent can bring in $2 million. That's $3.2 billion. For $160 million, we could bring in $3.2 billion. Does that make sense to you, Mr. George? Revenue agents are actually even more productive than the revenue officers who I was referencing earlier in my discussion. So, so they're even more productive than the $2 million per person. They could bring even more than $2 correct. million per that's person. Correct. Seems like a good investment to me. I think we've got to get off this whole topic of President Obama, President Trump, Affordable Care Act, this, that, the other thing. We need more resources for the IRS to go after people in doing audits and encouraging voluntary compliance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Reed, to inquire. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, to follow up on what my colleague from New York was just articulating, just so we're all on the same page. So it, 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 there has been no testimony, and I think the testimony has been very clear, that how many employees would we have to hire at the IRS to collect the whole $486 billion tax gap? Um, just because $2 million per revenue officer is supposedly going to get this magical $3.2 billion um, into the pocket does not mean that if you got enough employees, um, you would get full 486. Isn't that correct, Mr. That George? That is correct, yes. So one of the things I really want to focus on today is, you know, I had an old adage uh, being raised. Uh, by my, my single mom here, who, when my father passed, was, you know, you work hard, but you work smart. And Dr. Herdon, you, your, your division of the IRS, to me, is very interesting and something that I hope we can prioritize uh, as a committee on a bipartisan basis, because your whole division is about taking data and effectively using that data to potentially address this tax gap situation. Isn't that correct? Isn't that what your whole Part of your mission is to do? By making our, uh, as I think it's been discussed before, our, our audit selection smarter, our, our ability to work cases smarter, yes, that's exactly yeah. right. Because no one envisions in the IRS world and in America, I think, having a, an IRS agent assigned to every American to go through their tax returns, right? That, that is just not productive use of time. And so what we're trying to do is use the data that we have access to as the federal government and say, there are red flags because the data is able to be mined using computer technology, computer software in a 21st century uh, capacity to red flag 
potential abusive, potential uh, <clears throat> errors that people are doing just innocently. Isn't that correct? Isn't that kind of one of the hearts that maybe we can agree upon? That's correct, yes, sir. Does anybody on the panel disagree with that type of prioritization in regards to allocating federal resources to accomplish that? And I notice, all, uh, uh, Mr. Mateek, you're gonna disagree with that? I would not disagree. I would just take it a little bit further. Uh, a lot of the work that Mr. Herndon does has to do with the, national, the statistical sample of individual taxpayers. What we've seen at GAO is in the, on the operational side, IRS can do better in terms of using the data they collect through correspondence audits, uh, audits of partnerships. Partnerships, since uh, partnerships, everyone's becoming a partnership. We, we've seen a decline in the formation of corporations. Partnership growth it has gone through the roof. However, IRS coding of partnership audits, they just throw all large partnerships in one large bucket. We have made a recommendation that they come up with a finer categorization, like they do for corporations, which would better inform what they're finding in their audits and therefore do exactly what you're saying, audit smarter. I appreciate that. Uh, that's very good input. And, and so just so I'm understanding the IRS's capability in order to embrace the 21st sec, uh, century technology that hopefully we both uh, sides of the aisle up here can support, the, the actual institution itself, does it have a commitment or has it moved into the 21st century, quote unquote, in order to have the capacity to read that data, to manipulate that data, to utilize that data in that smarter, more effective way? Uh, there's a two-part answer to that. Uh, the one part, the first part is that in my organization, we have a, a unique set of tools and technologies and capabilities that- Does the entire agency have the capability to read your data? Uh, with the right permissions, yes. With the right permissions, okay. So there's no underlying software. So, because my understanding too is that the Cobalt, the old Fortran type of language is floating around in a lot of the IRS. Does the agency itself have the capacity to share that data instantaneously with each other? Um, some of that has to do with the way that the data is provisioned through the operating, through the uh, operational systems, which is the subject of the modernization plan that I think you've heard about and that is a priority of the commission. And see that, and so from, from your perspectives on the panel, what, what is the obstacle to the IRS moving away from that antiquated computer software platform into one that is interchangeable, more of a, a, a function. What, what's, what's, what's preventing that from happening? Again, I, I think uh, it's a resources question, and I think the modernization plan hopefully is the so pathway forward. So it's just cash. Forward. You're saying cash, and there's no, there's no territorial, there's no, anti, there's no pushback from the organization itself saying, nope, this is the way we've been doing business for 30 years, and this is the way we're going to continue to do it. It's just cash. Not, that I've, seen, not that I've seen as, a, as an impediment to the In the data world, but data, Mr. Correct. George, I think you're you, right. You, you do have to keep in mind, it, it, it's so methodical, it, it moves so slowly that by the time they institute one systemic change, it's antiquated. And, it's, and then they decide, well, this is not really going to work for us in the next 10 years, and they move on to something else. And so it, it right, needs so help. It sounds like some good planning techniques maybe could, could be deployed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate this opportunity. Appreciate this hearing. And uh, gentlemen, appreciate your time today, as well as, although you seem like experts in this field, I'm still sure that there was some preparation that went into your testimony, so thank you for that as well. Um, clearly, the tax gap, as we've been talking about today, is not just a number showing us what we could be collecting in taxes. It's also a failure of us to collect those taxes. It's a gap that demonstrates that there still are a number, a number of issues in our tax administration from the difficulties facing the IRS to the priorities or lack of priorities that we have set for audits and collections. It shows us how Congress can be short-sighted in attempting to reduce deficits, but also how a lack of investment can be costly in the long run. It shows us how the complexity of our tax laws are not just challenges for taxpayers, but for our tax collectors as well. It shows us how honest mistakes by low-income families can be punished, but tax avoidance by the wealthy can be awarded. I am hopeful that today's hearing is providing some insight into how we can better invest in the IRS
fix our laws to discourage tax gaming and reduce the burdens of compliance for those with lower incomes. Now, I think you've heard a little bit today, but obviously you know that members of Congress and on both sides of the aisle have expressed concerns about rising deficits, and I'm one of those members. But in many circumstances, failing to properly invest in our institutions can backfire and clearly leave our country in more debt. Nowhere is this better demonstrated than our lack of investment in the IRS, especially after what we heard today. We know that for every dollar Congress appropriates to the IRS, $4 is collected. Each dollar invested can receive an even greater return if it is spent directly on enforcement. Yet Congress has been starving the IRS of its funding and with consequences for that tax gap. In fact, since 2010, IRS funding and enforcement staffing levels have shrunk by nearly 40 percent. Now, Mr. George, and excuse me, Inspector General George, you know that well. But if you could, and I'm sure you've said this earlier today, but it's been about two and a half hours since you started, what impact uh, are reduced funding levels and enforcement staffing having on the number of art audits that IRS can perform? Yeah. Again, I'm going to rely on the actual numbers from when I stated it before, but there is no doubt that conducting audits is the most effective way for the Internal Revenue Service to address the underpayment payment of taxes by individuals and organizations. And so you, when you have fewer revenue agents available to conduct audits, you receive, the government receives fewer receipts, few of the dollars owed to it. Understood, understood. Now, in my district on the Central Coast of California, I got about 50,000 families that benefit from the earned income tax credit, uh, which lifted many of them up out of poverty. Um, but unfortunately, low income taxpayers uh, that take the EITC are more likely to be audited, as we've heard today, and as you know, than the taxpayer making nearly one million per year. Considering the majority of EITC overpayments are unintentional errors and that those who make the errors can be barred from taking the EITC for a number of years, the focus of EIT recipients, we feel, is unfair. Focus on those recipients. Um, Inspector, Inspector General George, is this an efficient use of our limited auditing ability? It, it's a complicated decision, but I'm going to give you a quick answer here. The EIT instruction forms, uh, Congressman, are 30 plus pages long, extremely complicated to explain to taxpayers. The vast majority of people who claim those uh, credits are doing so through third parties, whether it's a tax assistance center or whether it's a volunteer organization that's doing it or a friend or family. But so we need to educate and the IRS needs to be a little more aggressive in terms of third-party people who are preparing tax returns, especially those with false requests or ultimately determined to be inaccurate requests, and penalize them. There needs to be a, a, a response to the people who are, are engaging, and I, and I don't want to be, I want to be very careful about the wording I use here, but who are making mistakes willfully or inadvertently in this very sensitive area. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. With that, recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byer, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I'd like to associate myself with my colleagues in Good job. calling for increased resources at the IRS and increased focus on high net worth evaders. Most of the dedicated civil servants of the IRS, many of them, at least, are my constituents, and I know how hard they work to ensure that the rest of government can function. I also want to associate myself with the comments of my friend Earl Blumenauer to affirm the exemplary service of John Koskinen. Uh, when he was IRS commissioner, he faced the most difficult job of managing a demoralized agency under constant attack from the then majority in the Congress. I was ambassador to Switzerland in Liechtenstein when the UBS leak cracked open the door of Swiss bank secrecy in a major way, really, for the first time. And uh, addressing the problem of Americans hiding money in Swiss banks for tax evasion was the, the, the priority of our mission those four years. And in the wake of the UBS leak, the U.S. was able to secure settlements with a large number of Swiss banks with many, many delinquent U.S. taxpayers and 
hopefully change Swiss bankruptcy secrecy going forward. And I recognize the complexity and the resources involved in chasing down our most inventive, dedicated, and well-resourced tax evaders. But we also, almost on a daily basis, had to deal with the counter-argument that the U.S. is also a major destination for global tax evaders looking for jurisdictions that will protect their privacy at the expense of their legal obligations. And this was thrown back in my face almost every day. In fact, the Tax Justice Network ranks the U.S. second only behind Switzerland in its financial secrecy index. And this is largely due to the ease with which anonymous LLCs can be established in certain states. They've been used by money launderers, corrupt government officials, dictators, and even just guard variety tax evasion. My friend from New York, Carolyn Maloney, has a bill, the Corporate Transparency Act, which will end that anonymity from a law enforcement perspective. So, Mr. Wood, as a tax attorney for all these years, do these anonymous LLCs and associated financial secrecy tactics make it harder for IRS enforcement to collect the taxes owed to the U.S. Treasury? And would knowing the true owners of these companies be a helpful tool in closing the tax gap? I'm sure it would be helpful to the IRS. There's also an awful lot of foreign tax authorities would be interested in getting that information. Um, on the other side, there are lots of um, foreign entities that are set up by typically by large U.S. corporations, and there's difficulty in obtaining um, access to information on them as well. So it's a two-way street. I do remember in, uh, in Switzerland when we were demanding that Credit Suisse and UBS turn over the names of all the U.S. taxpayers that had accounts, um, we had the same challenge, I think, I think it was Brazil or Argentina, asking for that from our American banks in Florida. Um, and I believe it was every member of the Florida delegation, Democrat and Republican, who objected to the Obama administration but not turning those records over. So the, the, the inequality, the asymmetry of that is a huge problem. Mr. McTeague and Mr. McGeorge, Inspector George, you both noted that complexity is a major problem. We now have the new tax code that allows the 20% pass-through on uh, LLCs and partnerships. Is that complexity exacerbating the tax gap? And to what extent, because there's mostly wealthy people that are using this, you know, with passive real estate investments and the like. Um, Congressman, I think it's too early to know for sure how, how that incentive is going to be exploited or followed carefully. Um, as I pointed out earlier, since 2002, uh, formation of partnerships or the number of partnerships has grown by 82 percent, whereas the number of corporations has fallen by 28 percent. So clearly, even before the tax reform, there was incentive to move to a partnership form of ownership. And with the, the new tax law, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, Inspector George. Uh, yes, sir, and I will associate my comments with those of my colleague here, but I would also note if you have a system of tax compliance, well, I guess, sir, having served overseas as an ambassador, certain nations, as you know, will fill out the tax for forms for their taxpayers and literally present them with uh, a fait accompli, a bill that they can contest or amend or what have you, and then otherwise simply sign it and send in you know, any tax obligation that they may have to meet. So the bottom line is making your, the, uh, as simple as possible for someone to fulfill their tax obligation, it would accomplish I think the majority of what it is that we're discussing today. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, let me recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Holding, to inquire. Thank you. And I want to thank the chairman for holding this hearing today. You know, closing the tax gap is another area, great area for bipartisan mm -hmm. work. We all agree we need to do that. And for bringing um, before us a great panel of witnesses that have allowed us an opportunity for a really deep an informative dive uh, on the issue. Now, while we've made sweeping changes designed to simplify the code and encourage increased compliance with the passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, one large area uh, that we did not address in the taxation is the taxation of Americans who are resident overseas. Uh, 
The United States is currently one of only two countries, the other being Eritrea, that operates a citizenship-based taxation regime whereby we tax American residents regardless of where they reside. And on top of this, citizens living and working in other countries, our citizens, are suffering with onerous burdens of FATCA and the FBAR requirements among a myriad of issues caused solely by an outdated code as it applies to American residents uh, overseas. And these burdens hamper the competitiveness of Americans in the global job market, often making U.S. citizens around 40 percent more expensive to hire than their foreign counterparts and have led to a spike of the number of Americans who are renouncing their citizenship uh, every year. I find it concerning when you travel overseas, you might go to Singapore and go to the American Chamber of Commerce in Singapore, and there are no Americans there. Um, so my worry is that these heavy burdens may encourage noncompliance among individuals living abroad, and especially by those so-called accidental Americans uh, that gain citizenship through their parents but have no ties with the United States. And I really worry about um, the record number of expatriations uh, that our citizens are uh, affecting around the world. Uh, Mr. Byer from Virginia, as he mentioned, was the uh, Swiss, our Swiss ambassador. And um, he, I know from speaking with him, he had to deal with a lot of expatriations, and the number is just rising precipitously. So I think maybe this question would be for you, Dr. Herndon. Does the IRS know the number of Americans living outside of the country as well as how many are not filing or under filing each year? Do we know that number? I don't have that number from my organization. Um, we don't have data specifically on that. Uh, there may be data accessible to some of the operating units to that okay. effect, but I couldn't comment. The, um, so if we don't have that data, we don't have an estimate on the amount of revenue lost due to their uh, noncompliance because you don't know that they exist. Yeah, not at this time. So do you think the IRS has the capability of discerning uh, you're discerning this data? Well, certainly with the access to the right data, but um, you know, to identify the right data sources and the feasibility of acquiring them. Well, I'm, I'm going to find out which one of you I should appropriately follow up with to try to find out uh, that data. I think it would be interesting. But I'd say if we're really interested in going and addressing the tax gap, I think we need to fully understand the problems faced by Americans around the world and craft solutions to simplify the code and encourage compliance for Americans who are resident overseas. And at the end of last year, I introduced a bill that would move the U.S. from the outdated citizenship-based taxation system towards a residency-based taxation system, which is used by every other country other than Eritrea. Um, and by simplifying this area of the code and aligning our system with the rest of the world, I think we could not only encourage increased compliance by Americans around the world, but greatly improve the lives and career aspects for Americans globally. I think it's important that Americans work in countries around the world. It's a great soft power projection. It's also good for security. The, um, I know that a lot of our U.S.-based companies who operate globally would really like to have more Americans you know, in the corporate chain of command overseas. So I hope that we're able to work on this, Mr. Chairman. Uh, throughout this Congress. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Moore, to inquire. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And just let me join my colleagues in thanking this very patient expert panel. Uh, many of our members have left and you're still here. Thank you. Listen, we, uh, there's been broad agreement, I think, among this panel. Uh, panel as well as our colleagues on both sides that we need more resources for the IRS, uh, education of taxpayers as well as tax preparers, uh, better technology. There was some discussion of the morale of the staff at the IRS uh, and the skills gap uh, uh, that, uh, that is created uh, there. Uh, and uh, I want to talk focus a little bit on efficiency, which has been raised several times throughout this, this hearing. And I guess uh, 
uh, Dr. Herndon, let me start with you. Um, you stated that, quote, leverage data and behavioral analysis to target noncompliance. Can you please explain that a little bit for me? Certainly. Um, there are two components to that, obviously, data and behavior. Um, data being you know, any indicator, as we've heard before, uh, on a, in a large data context that looks anomalous. In other words, you know, compared to you know, other types of similar looking returns, this return seems to have something that stands out. Uh, so that's one way that we use data to detect potential noncompliance. Again, one among many. So um, and the behavioral aspect of noncompliance is being able to target or, or let's say to focus our attention on particular areas where we know from prior experience or prior research we're likely to see noncompliance. So we know, you know. Is this, is this something that it improves the efficiency of, is this effective? That's is correct. this working? Yes. Yeah, These data, so. okay. Let me, um, let me ask you uh, about efficiency. Many people have asked about uh, collecting uh, taxes from uh, noncompliance or errors with the earned income tax credit. I think Mr. Davis uh, really raised a number of uh, troubling states and counties where there seemed to be a higher than average uh, uh, a tax collection effort, auditing effort. And as a matter of fact, um, w we've noted that uh, the IRS examined 1.4 percent of the taxpayers uh, claiming the earned income tax credit, but examined less than eight-tenths percent of the individuals who reportedly had 200 thousand dollars to a million dollars in tax liability. Same thing for small corporations with assets under $10 million. I mean, you're more likely to be audited if you claim the EITC than if you're a $10 million corporation. Is that one of the examples of inefficiency or do uh, uh, have we calculated uh, that the uh, rate of return on collecting the earned income tax credit is greater than, than if we were to go after these taxpayers. And maybe sure. I, I could ask that question of, uh, of uh, Director McTeague. Mm -hmm. uh, again, as, as I think I might have mentioned earlier, you know, we don't actually set the exam plans or... Okay, Mr. Determine. McTeague, can you answer that sure. this question for me? Uh, Congresswoman, Congresswoman Moore, uh, in 2012 we did do a study looking at the uh, the examination of different taxpayers and different types of returns, and we found exactly uh, what you were suggesting, that IRS could be more efficient or more productive auditing at a higher rate uh, those earning in excess of 200000 Thank you so much for that. And let me, let me ask uh, uh, Inspector General George uh, my last question here. I'm running out of time. Um, do you think there's some moral hazard in all of these corporations realizing that they can spend money and fight and litigate and that you aren't gonna prioritize going after them because it would cost too much money and the IRS doesn't have the resources. If we all know that here, they know it too. Um, is that a fair statement on my part that there's some moral hazard in people recognizing that we aren't going to come after them unless you're getting the earned income tax credit where we have a law saying we're going to prioritize getting you. You know, I am of the mindset, uh, uh, Congresswoman Moore, that people generally do the right thing and especially people who have a lot to lose. And if corporations, as I said before, there's a difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion. One is legal, one is not legal. So there are, are many ways for businesses to legally reduce their tax obligation, and they have the ability to hire expert accountants, expert tax lawyers, so on and so forth, whereas the little person does not have access. Uh, but, 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 but the question is with the IRS, is this a disincentive for us to go after them, knowing that they are Corporation X with all this power? Well, is there a moral hazard within the IRS? I mean, it exists, but again, the IRS will go after people they know have a lot of money uh, that they are owed, that the IRS is owed. So, Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Thank fine. you for your indulgence. Thank the gentlelady. With that, let me recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Murphy, to inquire. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all, your, all the witnesses for your testimony. You know, the tax gap is hard to understand and a little discussed, uh, a seldom discussed topic, and, but I'm glad we're taking the time today to learn a bit more. Because when I hear a $400 billion gap in anything, um, I want more information. You know, our tax system is based on a notion of voluntary compliance. Um, and each taxpayer is responsible for calculating the amount that they owe and then paying their bill. And this isn't always an easy task, and the tax code has only grown in complexity over the years. Most people and businesses alike act in good faith and try to comply. However, either by accident or choice, not everyone pays their bill. And we heard today that we collect about 84% of taxes owed, which leaves around $400 billion uncollected each year, and this is what is known as the tax gap. We can argue and debate about what the proper level of taxation should be, but regardless of how we feel about how much we tax, we should all agree that people and corporations should pay what they owe. So to do this properly, I believe we need a properly funded IRS with enough resources to monitor compliance and enforce collection. It's well documented and, and um, well discussed during this hearing that the IRS has seen a steady decline in funding over the past decade, leading to a fewer number of agents in the field and fewer audits performed. I think this is just another example of how cynical politics has turned the IRS into a punching bag for political purposes and left it short of the resources it needs to perform um, an important function. And as the representative from Florida's 7th Congressional District, I have the proud honor of having the Maitland Orlando IRS office in my district. And I've heard many times that Congress should examine the resources dedicated to the IRS and if we have enough IRS employees to effectively carry out the mission. And while our economy grows both in size and in uh, sophistication, we have deliberately hamstrung our ability to enforce compliance by not allowing the agency charged with tax collection to keep pace. I can't help but wonder if there's an easy answer to improving on that 84% compliance rate. Mr. George, do you agree with my premise that Congress has directly impacted the ability of the IRS to conduct effective enforcement of our tax laws? And could you elaborate um, on how the size of the IRS workforce has changed over the last 10 years? Yes, they at uh, one point had over 100,000 both full-time and seasonal employees. They are now down to 80,000 roughly, and so a 20% reduction. That's tremendous. Fewer resources, fewer man, power, fewer uh, uh, results are going to happen uh, from that. So there's no question that that is a factor. Um, but uh, I, I don't think this has gotten enough attention to, though, uh, Congresswoman, and that is, you know, the tax code could assist all of us, the IRS, Congress, and everyone who is involved in this process in achieving the goal of reducing the tax gap. So uh, you may were, have heard my testimony and that of others here earlier, more information reporting, uh, a requirement that established by Congress or through regulations by the IRS that certain entities, organizations provide information on the amount of money that they pay employers or you know contractors or whatever it is that you decide, Congress decides, in, you know, in its power to re make mandated, avail mandated so that it's available to the IRS for them to make these decisions as to what is ultimately owed. And then ultimately that helps the taxpayer because they really will pay what they know they owe. But there's been a trend and a push of late to simplify, right, be able to file on a postcard. Do you think that works in um, contradiction with what you're suggesting, that we um, need more information? I know this was a debate recently had by Congress about how much of a role the IRS itself should have in assisting taxpayers comply with their tax obligations. So I think the discussion was, should the IRS produce tax returns uh, for taxpayers, similar to what I made reference to earlier about other countries mm -hmm. sending an effective tax bill and then having people just send back uh, information. So yes, simplicity would help a, a tremendous amount. Great, thank you. Um, what, what do you think would be the first and most obvious impact if the IRS had greater funding and personnel? Well, they would have to have 
uh, especially in the area of the tax gap, they need to develop a modern strategic plan. They haven't updated that since 2007. So that, that's the first starting point, all right? And then once they do that, they can allocate resources that 100 million more in an appropriate manner. Thank you. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to our witnesses for being so patient and joining us today. Um, well, there have been many issues that have been raised today that deserve our attention. One thing that I want to particularly focus in on is the fallout from congressional action related to the IRS. Now, we know that for a decade, um, the Republicans have slashed IRS funding, which has had devastating effects across the agency. And of course, as we've heard um, from testimony earlier, perhaps the largest impact has been on the staffing for audits. A statistic that I found staggering from today's TIGTA testimony comes from their report that the audit rate has decreased from 1.11% of all returns in 2010 to 0.5% in 2016. Um, and there also appears to be a big disparity in audit coverage. Um, the chance of being audited if you file a return with an EITC claim and earn under $25,000 is greater than it is for someone who earns up to $999,000 or if you're a small corporation with under $10 million in assets. And that just kind of blows my mind because it, it gives me images of trying to get, you know, blood from a turnip versus going where the, the money is. Um, there was a recent article uh, that highlighted the number of exams occurring in areas where people live below the poverty line and showing that that's higher than the number where the median income is among the highest in the country. Um, Inspector General George, your testimony notes that high income taxpayers have the most opportunity to avoid in, uh, to, I'm sorry, to engage in tax avoidance. Is the IRS's current audit program unfairly weighted towards low-income taxpayers? We're, we're reviewing that um, to, uh, now, and we will be able to. I'll be able to respond definitively once that review is completed. Do you have a hunch as to what, whether that's true or not? Well, I, again, the bottom line is higher-income individuals have access to expert accountants and tax lawyers, whereas lower-income individuals do not. And so you can take it from there in terms of the ultimate result. Um, do you think compliance might be increased if the IRS shifted its audit focus away from low-income taxpayers to those who earn higher income? Or do you think the very virtue of the fact that higher-income individuals have resources to combat? Um, well, the, as again, as I stated earlier in this hearing, higher-income audits do result in more tax assessments being made, and so in effect, people owing more and paying more when they are done. So yes, it would be beneficial if the IRS fo refocused its attention. Um, what have I seem to recall that there was an initiative in the IRS to examine high-income, high-wealth taxpayers. What, whatever happened with that initiative? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, OK. Um, with the limited time that I have left, I'd like to talk about the IRS workers themselves. Um, Director McTe uh, McTeague, earlier this year, the GAO reported that hiring freezes, retirements, and low morale have shrunk the IRS's enforcement workforce. Can you give us more insight into the long-term consequences that this can have on the agency and the important mission that it's tasked to carry out? Oh, absolutely. Uh, as uh, Inspector General George pointed out earlier, enforcement has a very high deterrence in terms of uh, noncompliance. And so, uh, you know, to the extent, and we've all pointed out that audit rates have fallen 40% uh, or audit personnel has fallen 40% since 2010. So, you know, fewer audits, it's logical that compliance may take a hit. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of noise in the numbers right now in terms of the voluntary compliance rate, so it's hard to measure that for sure, um, uh, but it, it certainly is a concern. Because I'll tell you what I hear from my constituents when I'm back home. Most people don't love paying taxes, um, but most people are okay with paying their taxes as long as they think that everybody is paying their fair share. And 
where people start to get angry is when they feel like they are being targeted and they are paying their fair share and other people who have more resources or more means are avoiding taxes or, and, and not paying their fair share. And so um, I would just leave you with the thought that voluntary compliance might actually increase if there was a belief that everybody who owed their taxes was going, uh, that enforcement was applied equally to everybody who owed taxes. And with that, I will yield back to the chairman. We thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford, to inquire. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you for holding this critically important hearing to discuss the nuances of the tax gap. Uh, today, I want to talk about how the tax gap impacts some of the most vulnerable constituents in my district. Clark County in Southern Nevada is the highest audited county in my state. And while we know that there are many factors that contribute to IRS audits, one thing is clear. There are notable disparities in the way the IRS audits people and the agency's use of limited enforcement resources. For instance, the agency ends up auditing taxpayers who earn their wages, many of them low income, at a disproportionate rate instead of pursuing wealthier individuals or large corporations, as has been noted throughout this hearing. In fact, IRS data shows that individuals making an average of $25,000 a year who claim the earned income tax credit were more likely to be examined by the IRS than wealthier Americans making up to a million dollars. I want to paint a clear picture as to what that looks like. In Nevada, a single mother of two trying to make ends meet on a $25,000 a year salary may be able to receive a tax credit of $4,133 through the earned income tax credit. And while that amount of money may, may seem nominal to some, to that single mother and her family, it can make a world of a difference in whether or not they're able to survive. Meanwhile, low and moderate income families who are seeing the greatest challenges, the IRS is not going after large corporations in the same capacity. Over the, five, the past five years, there has been a significant decline in audits for corporations with assets of $10 million or more. Ten years ago, every large corporation with assets of $20 billion or more were audited, and today, only 50% face IRS reviews. So we must ask ourselves, why are some of our most vulnerable Americans facing more scrutiny under the IRS than the wealthy and corporations? Director McTeague, can you share with me how many returns are filed by individuals and corporations every year? Yes, Congressman. Um, the number of individual tax returns filed each year is about 150 million. Uh, the number of tax returns filed by corporations, I believe, is in the order of uh, 7 million. Uh, to speak to your point in terms Can, uh, of thank uh, you. Thank different, you. Thank okay, you. Let me, I have some other questions. How many audits does the IRS do every year? How many audits does IRS do every year? The most recent figures that we have looked at uh, show about a little bit less than one million. So 150 million individual income tax returns on average. Total, all type, including corporations, about 250 million. That's and of that number, about one million are audited. Is that correct? That is correct. How many of these audits are on taxpayers who claim the earned income tax credit? Uh, the numbers that I have uh, suggest about 381 exams were performed on people who received the EITC in 2017. 381,000 of the nearly 1 million. Do we see a problem with that disproportionate targeting of low-income individuals? Congressman, in 2012, we did a study uh, that suggested that IRS would reap a billion dollars more in, for in enforcement revenue if they reallocated uh, how they re reallocated their enforcement resources from low-income to higher-income tax returns. However, I do want to note that 
IRA, it's not simply IRS's discretion. There are other uh, the statute regulations that require IRS to audit a certain number of EITC returns because it falls under uh, IPERIA, the improper payments, and That's under that, they claiming need to my time. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, and I'm not suggesting they shouldn't be audited, but they shouldn't be audited at a disproportionate rate than millionaires and big corporations. And if your study indicated that we could yield a billion dollars more by ensuring that we are being fair across the board, then we should approach that policy and that process. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. With that, let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Gomez, to inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think what you're, you're hearing is a frustration because a lot of us do represent working class communities. Um, some mixed communities, but very working class. Um, a, one of my Republican colleagues earlier made an argument that a more simple tax code would increase compliance and reduce uh, the tax gap. You all seem to agree with that, that basic premise. Um, who on average has a more simple tax return? Somebody who makes $25,000 a year and claims their earned income tax credit or someone who makes between $200,000 and $1 million a year? Uh, Mr. Mr. George? Uh, it would really depend on this on, on average. circumstance. But, on, a, on average. But obviously, if you have less deductions, less yeah. dividends, it would seem that you would have an easier time or should have an easier so, time. So on, on average, you know, this is what I'm trying to paint for the American people. On average, somebody who is making $25,000 or less a year claims the EITC mm -hmm. is going to have a more simple, straightforward return versus somebody who has more deductions and somebody who makes between $200,000 and $1 million. But as people were pointing out, the people that are claiming their earned income taxes are actually uh, in, earn income tax credit are more likely to be audited. And that's where it just doesn't, doesn't jive. Um, one of the things, and if we're serious, as you all noted, if you're serious about reducing the, the, the tax cap, you go after the people um, that owe the most money. Earlier at the beginning, you, met, you quoted, I guess, Willie Sutton. I had to look him up because I'm not part of that generation. <laughs> um, you know, why do you rob banks? It's because they go where the money is. But it doesn't seem like all of you are going where the money is. Even um, later in the testimony, Mr. Wood said, he, I think he also said, testified, if you want to collect taxes, go after high net worth individuals and corporations. But then the statistics show that that's not what's going on. And if we want to even highlight even that even further, um, Mr. George, when you responded to some question and you said, when they do audit high net worth individuals, the return on investment is higher, right? So that's what's bothering people. That just logically speaking, the, that it seems that you're going after the, the small fry, right? The person that, like, instead of going after the Willie Sutton who's robbing the bank, you're going after the kid who stole a pack of gum, right? Um, not saying that they should, bo sh both individuals shouldn't be held accountable according to the law. That's not what I'm saying, right? I'm saying that that's what we have to do, but there's some, it feels insulting to working class Americans that they're being treated differently. Um, also, just to add ins insult to injury, um, Inspector General George, you testified that the IRS collects, um, collection, IRS collection staff has been slashed. Also, that the IRS uses private debt collectors and reviewed this program. What did you find? Um, the program has had various um, forms over the course of the last 20 plus years. Uh, in the most recent incarnation, there are currently three groups who have contracts with the IRS to conduct uh, this activity. Yeah. Um, it's a mixed bag in terms of the results. Yeah. Um, they are given some of the most difficult cases by the IRS. Mr. Mr. George, let me, because you're, you're, I'm running out of time, but even though I go last, I have a lot to say. Um, uh, one of the things I want to just kind of point out in your report to Congress titled the FY 2019 Biannual Independent Assessment of Private Collection Agency Performance. On page six, it says, average number of outbound calls per taxpayer account CBE group was 106.1. 106.1. Um, am I reading that correct? 100 and, uh, that the IRS debt collector is calling each constituent on average 106 
point one times. That's correct. How many time? How many calls do you think is too much? I I don't know the answer to that question, sir. But it seems like a lot. It does yeah. seem like a lot. And because other debt collectors were a lot less, correct? Like on average. My understanding, yes. Um, so it is my standing that the IRS previously also agreed to exclude from these private debt collectors the debts of SSI and SSDI recipients. And SSI and SDI, as you know, are some of our most vulnerable constituents. Yet, the National Taxpayer Advocates Report states that over 12,000 SSDI recipients were assigned to private debt collectors in fiscal year 2018. Why are we calling these people over 100 times? Yeah, no, this program definitely needs a, a review, which we are mm -hmm. doing, uh, uh, Congressman, uh, because it is... Um, a very sensitive area. Yeah. There's no question about that. And, and my point is that it does feel that people who are working class get, get the short end of the stick, especially the, um, the folks that are struggling to get by. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me thank our witnesses today, and I want to say personally and professionally how lucky America is to have people of this competence come in to testify here. It's a reminder again of the professional uh, staffers across Capitol Hill and the agencies and what they provide every day in terms of the certitude of knowledge. So I'm very grateful for the testimony you offered today. And please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. And with that, the committee stands adjourned.